All right, welcome to the stream. So, uh, what we're gonna do this stream is we're um, kind of gonna go over what has changed. If you've been following my spam on Twitter, you'll probably know what has changed. Uh, but I'm just gonna go over that quickly, and then I'm gonna kind of talk about what is required for us to start to get some performance out of this and start using it for fuzzing. So. We need to uh, fix up some of this code coverage stuff. Uh, right now it requires an allocation every time I look up a key in the dictionary, uh, which is really expensive. So we're gonna try and find some way to organize that. Um, and then we're going to look into how to take a snapshot of a system. So let me get rid of this text. Um, we're gonna look into how to take a snapshot of a whole system and then load up that snapshot, resume execution, inject a fuzz input, and then reset the VM over and over to start fuzzing. So we need to kind of pick a target. So throughout the stream, uh, at least this first part where I'm going to be kind of going through more development and fixing up some of the perf things in the coverage side, uh, feel free to suggest things for us to look at. Um, anything that we're going to look at needs to be reasonable enough that it's not critical if we find an ode on stream. Obviously, it won't be weaponized and it'd probably be fixed by the time someone would weaponize it. Uh, but it's just important that we, we don't look at any too critical of a target. All right, so uh, not much has changed in the world of apple pie. First of all, for people who might be new to the stream, I probably should show what it is. So Apple Pie is an open source uh, tool I'm working on that is a hypervisor built on top of Box. So it uses a hypervisor from uh, Windows uh, hypervisor virtualization platform, I think is what it's called, or hypervisor platform API. Um, and using that, I'm able to get a lot of speed out of Box that traditionally you're not able to get. Then with Box, that provides the device simulation for things like the screen and the disk and other things that the system relies on. Um, and it also allows me to switch into an emulation mode, which gives me maximum possible um, instrumentation. So I could hook memory accesses, I could do really sophisticated breakpoints on really weird conditions. Uh, further, you could add like taint tracking or something, which uh, I probably won't eventually get to, but I, I know someone working on it for for box already. So let's see. So currently uh, in the last couple days, I added code coverage in the last stream, which just basically gathered coverage information uh, for Windows and Userland. It kind of could handle symbol support if you had the symbols already pre-parsed and put into a folder. So I've changed that model quite a bit. So now if you have a sim check in your path, uh, which you would if you have the debugging tools installed and configured in your path, um, then it will uh, then it will be able to automatically find the DLL or executable that was identified in memory, download that from the symbol store, and then further download the actual um, download the actual symbols for it and apply them. So. The build process hasn't changed at all. It's pretty much the same. Let me make sure I'm up to date, and I am. So if I go into this, I've been booting just the Windows install CD. That, since it's read-only, it means I don't have to worry about corrupting the disk if I need to shut it down or something's broken and crashes or freezes up. So I have a, a Boolean at the top of this lib.rs, which has coverage disable. I can disable all coverage using that, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, let's see, I actually want to use two different prompts here. It'll make it a little bit easier for me. Um, okay. So, let's see, if I run it without uh, symbols, I'm able to, or without coverage at all, I'm able to boot Windows in a, a pretty short amount of time. Um, so here we'll just boot up the Windows 10 install CD, and let me see if I can get rid of that. Okay. Yes. So we're just booting up, nothing too crazy happening. It's going to identify where the module list is, but it's not actually going to use that module list at all. Um, and that it's going to do kind of by scanning through kernel memory to 
try to identify something that looks like the process list. I have tried over numerous projects to find a better way of doing that, and I haven't been able to. So we're able to boot up into the setup screen in about 30, 35 seconds, which is, which is pretty good um, compared to actual box where it's probably about 10 minutes. But when I enable coverage, you'll see that this starts to get a lot slower. So this coverage is going to automatically download the symbols, in which case they're usually cached because I've already done this before. Um, but you can see once it finds that module list, it starts downloading the symbols for all the DLLs that it observes execution in. So it doesn't download all the symbols for all the modules. It only downloads them as we've realized, hey, we're executing code in this. Uh, I want to figure out what the symbols are. So it's loading those symbols and further it's gathering coverage and also crashing because I have some weird issue apparently. Uh, let me try that again. So I think what's happening is uh, I'm not syncing the X save state and I think the hypervisor guest is using um, AVX instructions. So if I context switch between the hypervisor and the emulator and I'm doing AVX stuff, I'll run into that issue pretty bad. Um, that's the only thing I can think of at this point that's causing this issue. Otherwise, it's like fundamentally an issue with the hypervisor platform. So by kind of tweaking things, we're able to make it less of an issue. You can see it's a timing issue, so it has to do with like where the context switches occur. Um, but you can see I'm reporting the, the coverage information for each DLL and executable in the system. Um, I'm up to about 250,000 unique uh, locations that we've gotten coverage out of, uh, which is a pretty big number, and now it's at 300,000. Uh, it's This whole system is going to be designed to work with full system coverage if you need it. Obviously, there's a performance loss here. We're taking probably about a minute and a half to boot into the setup screen versus the 30 seconds before. Um, however, we've got some performance issues in the... Um, in the lookups for these that we're going to kind of work on first. Once we get that figured out, then we're going to start trying to take a snapshot. Now, if that blue screen you saw uh, continues to be a serious issue, uh, then we might also have to try and root cause and fix that bug. So there we go, we booted up into the Windows setup screen where we gathered 392,000 locations of coverage. Um, we can see that distribution in what modules, so we can see there's a lot that happened in NTOS kernel, of course, a um, couple of user land things where things were happening, uh, NTDLL, of course, for anything user land, that's going to get used a lot. But we can see coverage on kind of the whole system without needing source, without needing, source, without needing to, to rebuild things, which makes this a, a super powerful tool for that. So... That took, uh, what did it take? 103 seconds. So uh, yeah, a little over a minute and a half to boot up to the same location that it took 30 seconds before without the coverage. So in my experience, I've never really had a performance slowdown gathering coverage. So I have this intuition of, hey, this should not be slower because I'm gathering coverage. So I'm going to try and think through that problem and figure out what I could possibly do to fix the perf issues that I'm facing. So if we look into kind of the coverage uh, architect, uh, it also outputs all the symbols um, into a, this coverage.txt file. So if you were to download this and boot whatever you wanted, uh, well, Windows is the only thing with symbol and module support, but you'll see all of the, the coverage that you're able to gather, which is, which is pretty awesome because uh, a lot of tools out there are not meant to work with hundreds of thousands of, of different locations of coverage and getting symbols for those. So uh, if we look at coverage disable, that's a good way to kind of find where coverage is being recorded because if that's where we disable it, it's probably at the start of where all the coverage is gathered. And we'll see we, we have this one function called report coverage. It's uh, marked as extern and it's reported uh, or it's exported out of this DLL that allows box to call this every time it tries to run an instruction. So it's trying to, every time box runs an instruction, it calls this. And then every time we exit the hypervisor, we also call this. Uh, further, if we detect that new coverage has been recorded, this function returns true versus false. 
So if the record we're trying to report is a new piece of coverage, then we know, hey, this is new coverage, and thus uh, we switch from using the hypervisor for a while to single stepping and box. So basically, if we randomly sample, hey, we got new coverage, uh, we step through that in box for a little bit longer, which allows us to gather a little bit more coverage than we would at a hypervisor level. And this gives us an approximate amount of coverage. Um, however, it's pretty good. As you can see, I got 400,000 unique events while just booting the installer for Windows. So now it's hard to say how many true unique locations are hit during that boot process. Maybe it's 10 million and we're missing almost all the coverage. But in my experience, using a coverage model like this uh, is typically 95 to 98% accurate. So you might miss really rare things, which sucks, because those are usually what you care about. But if you see something, you single step for a while, and hopefully you pick those rare things up. Um, okay, so this report coverage, as I mentioned, was called uh, after every VM exit. So this is after, uh, this is, where are we at? This is running the hypervisor right here. Uh, we're doing some timekeeping to figure out how much time we're spent in the hypervisor. We update that statistic. And then we get the context from the hypervisor state and then sync that context over to the box state such that we can switch into emulation if we need to. Finally, uh, once, we, uh, once we have exited and gotten that context, we're going to report this coverage, this new location of coverage uh, through that function, and then we're going to just go back to everything as normal. Further on the box side of things, there is uh, this instrumentation stuff where they have an uh, BX instrumentation before execution. So this macro, this define is used every single time an instruction is about to be executed. So what I do is I report the um, I report that coverage using this global that I load library and get proc addressed. And this will call into that Rust code every single time we execute a single instruction in box. So given box can theoretically run at 100 million instructions per second, usually, uh, that means we need to be able to write a function that can probably handle at least 5 to 10 million calls per second. And currently, our routine cannot do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to write not only uh, some performance improvements to it, but we're going to write a test case that allows us to quickly observe the performance properties of this uh, function. So um, what we're going to kind of quickly do is we're going to do a test. Now, I don't know if I want to do the test right here, right next to the function, or if I want to do it in a different file, but we'll just start it here. So we're going to start with uh, function test coverage performance. So if you're not used to Rust tests, this just allows us to have a function. Um, we've annotated it with tests. So now, even though this is a DLL project and it can't actually run on its own, uh, we're able to go into the specific, uh, in this case, it is uh, Boxervisor. And cargo test, we can just do a test. And this will be a non-release build. And we can do cargo test release, and now we have a release build. So I have this test sim check, which kind of validates that our automatic symbol downloading works and, and everything is, is good there. That was a test I wrote a few days ago, or probably a day ago, when I added that. Um, and now we have this new test of test coverage performance. So we can panic at the end here, and this will call cause all of the screen contents to be written to the screen. So I kind of... I do this a lot where I just hack up the test and make it panic at the end. And now I can see the ASDF print from the print, and then I can see the ASDF from the panic. So what I'm going to do is I need to set up the environment that this function ex uh, expects to work in, and that is with this, um, this coverage thread local. So I think it is actually all good to work by defaults. So let me just kind of see. Uh, so actually, we won't need the thread locals, I think, at all, because they'll automatically initialize when we call it. Let's just see if we are able to get this set up. Oh, man, I'm going to need like a VM environment as well. Hmm. Because it's going to look for that module list. Oh, I didn't think about that. Hmm. <laughs> 
That's really frustrating. Um, what I could maybe do is write a test that actually boots up Windows. And then I can try and report coverage in a loop. Because the issue, the issue that we're having is when we report coverage, uh, first of all, we only gather coverage in long mode just to make things a little bit easier, to make the tests a little simpler, make everything cleaner for now. We'll add 32-bit support if we need it later. Um, we update some statistics. We get the, um, the kernel module list, which would be resolved already. Uh, there's Every second, we kind of look through memory and try to gather information and pointers about the kernel and the target on our test. So this is going to try and grab that. There's a chance that this is on none value, meaning we haven't run that. We haven't found where these structures are in the guest yet, um, which is fine. And then we use this module list cache to try and get the module plus offset for this uh, RIP location where we're currently executing. Um, if that lookup fails, then we're going to try to uh, relook up this uh, module list. So this cache starts out as empty. So the very first time we hit this function, obviously it will miss. It will then say, hey, we couldn't find it. And it will try to look up, uh, it'll try to get the module list. So basically if you're, this allows us to kind of cache the current state of the module list. And if you context switch, uh, or if a new DLL is loaded, um, this will hopefully pick it up because you just got new coverage in a new DLL. It finds it doesn't have that in the module list. It reloads the module list. Now, this isn't perfect because it's possible that there could be collisions in here and we could report coverage wrong. But um, the performance improvement is pretty much required because we can't get the module list every time. We could maybe cache the module list per CR3, but CR3s could be reused. So uh, there's... It's just kind of a hard problem to solve correctly unless you have some serious hooks into the OS. Um, if we successfully were able to look up this module list, then we save this off as the new cached module list. Um, and then we uh, get the module offset based on these, this new module list. And keep in mind, this could fail again. There's a chance if we're running jitted code that it's not in a module at all, and this will just constantly return, return nothing. Finally, if we couldn't get the module list at all, we return out because if it wasn't in the cached one and we weren't able to get a new one, then we have no way of resolving it, so we're just going to bail out early. Once that's done, we look up this cached module offset. If we were able to resolve the module, then we're going to report the coverage for this module and offset. And this is where it starts to get really nasty. So this code is running almost every time. So the hot path is you're coming through here, you resolve it from the cache so you don't have to redo the module list. You then probably have it in a module. It's actually really rare that it's an unknown module. Um, but then, due to the way that we have a string in, the, in a structure for this module, we actually have to clone it so we can look up that key. Um, so we're, this is causing an allocation and a copy of dynamically probably 30 bytes. And then we're looking it up and then inserting it, we allocate it again. That's fine because this only happens rarely. And then once again, when we look it up, um, I guess I don't need another deep clone here. That's an immediate issue that can be fixed because now we already deep clone it. Historically, we didn't uh, deep clone it in two places. Um, let's see. We're going to get rid of this test because it's going to be hard to use it. So, okay. So now that gets rid of one allocation and free per iteration, which probably helps. Um, so let's, right now we only care about the module lookup. Let's get rid of the symbol resolution by just commenting out all the symbol stuff. So we're gonna do basically everything we do with normal coverage by looking it up for module offset. Uh, we're gonna figure that out and we're gonna save that coverage, but we're not gonna look up the symbols and save them to a file. Currently, these only are saved to a file, so they don't really do anything for us yet. So obviously, we have a lot of warnings of unused code. So now we can see kind of, is the performance issue looking up the module offset, or is it looking up the symbol? Um, and I'm pretty sure it's both. So we'll see how long this takes to boot. The way I've been doing this is just exiting the VM once I see the Windows um, 
the Windows image in the startup box, and that's kind of what I've been using as my benchmark. Obviously, if we blue screen, we're gonna have issues. Um, if that bug becomes more and more of an issue, we'll, uh, we'll fix it. So let's see. I'm guessing it's still gonna be slow because that even though we're doing half as many allocations, we're still doing a lot of allocations. You can see uh, we're getting, uh, what is that? Like 2 million, 2 million calls to that function every second. Um, so we're gonna need some way to make this function a bit faster, but we're gathering all the coverage that we were before. Nothing has changed there. We just don't have the symbol output. Oh no, did we blue screen? Damn it. All right, let me, uh, let me add one quick test here. So I think all of the, all of these blue screens are due to X save not being synced. If we look at X crow, uh, I think this is the way you enable all of the, yeah, this is how you enable all of the different features. So what I can do is I can try and print out the value of xcrow uh, to see kind of what the guest is trying to use for a feature set. And if it's using AVX, then I immediately know that anytime I context switch during an AVX situation, we're having a serious issue. So, and the way that we could fix that is make CPU ID lie and report that it doesn't support AVX or X save. So let's see. And the reason I'm not gonna sync it is the X save state is opaque. So I can't trivially sync that state between box and the hypervisor because since they're opaque, I'm, I guess I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing that box has their own opaque version and I can't directly sync them. And I'd have to pretty much reverse out all those things to get them to sync up. So uh, unless they're not opaque and I'm just completely mem remembering wrong. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say if, um, what do I want? Context, let's say context.xcro.reg64 and one shift, uh, I think it's two there, one shift two. It's not equal to zero. Then we're gonna panic using AVX. So this is basically checking if the AVX uh, X save state is enabled inside of the hypervisor. And if it is, then it's not necessarily using, um, oops, and we didn't even build that. The last test, so. This will panic if it thinks it's trying to use, uh, did it already panic? No way, really? I, now I'm skeptical. Uh, where's that coming from? I wonder if that's coming for bo from box or the hypervisor, uh, dot rig 64. So we're gonna change it into a normal print. We're gonna kind of monitor this value, but that's that's gonna be a pretty serious issue if that's the case. So that's got seven set, which should be SSE x87. Uh, so, and then one F. So Windows enables all those features. Oof, okay. So one thing we can do is we're gonna, sorry for the tangent, but this bug kind of needs to be fixed because I think this is what's causing the freezes. So let me, I think by upping the frequency of which we emulate. So this time we're gonna emulate every single time we exit out of the VM. This should greatly increase the chances of that blue screen happening um, and the higher chance of it happening, the tighter our debug loop and the faster we can try and whittle down what this actual bug is. So hopefully we see this blue screen and die a lot. So the other way this shows up, I think, is it hangs. I'm pretty sure it just hanged there, which is good. So unless it's just halting on these prints, but I, I'm pretty sure it's completely stuck. So let me... I'm actually going to put this print in our 
um, in our statistics print loop, that only happens every second. So we can figure out if it's actually the print causing it to slow down or the, or not. So yeah, we can see it boots up with, with nothing enabled. It looks like, yeah, there we go. So that's what I like to see a uh, uh, blue screen almost immediately. So, and I would guess it's using AVX and X save in that case. Yeah, so now it's blue screening pretty much every time almost immediately, which is a good sign. Uh, emulated CPU ID, bypassing. Um, okay, so one of the things we can do in box first is try to determine um, if it's box reporting the CPU ID as supporting AVX or if it's Windows. So what I'm going to be able to do is go into uh, the hardware we're emulating, which is this Skylake X. And I can go into its CPU definitions and I can say AVX. So it's enabling these extensions, but I don't really care about how it enables them. I care about um, where it reports to CPU ID, CPU ID that it supports them. So we're gonna wanna go through and almost disable all of these. Um, let's see, I think Xsave might be able to give us everything. So I'm just gonna kinda look up the process. If the OS dev manual isn't good enough then, or the OS dev wiki is not good enough, we can go to the Intel manual and go directly to the source. But this should tell us for AVX the different things we need to do. So yeah, these different features. I think uh, Windows requires SSC2. So what we could effectively do is disable everything. Um, I could disable pretty much everything after SSC2 and make sure that those bits are, are not set. So let's see, AVX. I can't remember if this is the section that goes through it. We'll see pretty quickly. XA feature set. Um, <laughs> checking for X save. So I think this is how AVX is enabled is through X crow. Uh, operating systems, blah, blah, blah. They can be disabled in XCrow, disabling them, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Hmm. I gotta find the, the different section. Here we go. Is this the one? XCrow, if OS X save is set, yep. So we will be able to see if X save is being used pretty, oh, it can only access it if it's already set. So we could, this bit is also readable as this. Okay. CPU ID leave D to enumerate the bits that are supported in Xcrow. And if one, yeah. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure if you don't have access to Xsave, you're not able to enable AVX at all. SSE you can still run, and but you just can't use the Xsave stuff. So I think we're just gonna try and disable only Xsave for now. So let me go through. This is Box making sure that these like extensions are enabled so it does allow them to be used. But what I can do is disable the actual Xsave reportings. I think that one. Um, and then this one is a dynamic node which is, uh, this is a mirroring of the actual X save state. So we can get rid of that as well. I think we want FX save. I think FX save is legacy. So I think we can keep that around. Let me double check. Hmm. Um. Okay. Keep in mind, we're only changing those CPU ID bits inside of the emulator itself. 
So we're still seeing that AVX is being enabled. Um, and yeah, now we're, hmm, we just triple faulted there, which is good. So we're gonna just need to add hooks into the hypervisor to make sure that we trap on CPU IDs. Yeah, because Windows is definitely detecting that there's a feature set here. In fact, it looks like Windows is, I don't know if it blindly enables everything, because that's saying that it's enabling, oops, uh, Let's see, exit, extend feature management. Is this where I was? We can look at sandpile. Uh, Xcrow. So it is trying to enable the bound instructions and the BREG. Okay, so it's not enabling AVX 512 or anything crazy, just. Uh, just these. So that means it's definitely coming from, I don't know how we're possibly booting. Further, right now we don't actually care about coverage because coverage is not causing this issue. So we're going to disable coverage to get the boot times a little faster and trying to cut down on our, our debug loop. So. Do, do, do. So the fact that it sometimes doesn't blue screen shows that clearly it's a syncing issue because just the randomness of timings and number of instructions and when we actually context switch kind of determines which instructions are run where. And if we get an interrupt while working with AVX instructions, we're probably, um, we're probably context switching. We just happen to be context switching in the middle of like a mem copy or something. So we're going to go and find the uh, CPU ID exits. We're going to enable these. So now we're going to get traps every time a CPU ID instruction is executed inside of the hypervisor, which will give us the ability to lie. So I don't think I have a hook for it right now. So this should, this should probably hard pan it because it's going to be like found an unsupported uh, call. Yep. So it almost immediately is complaining. So, yep, unhandled VM exit reason. So I'm gonna open up the hypervisor platform bindings, put it to the side, and I can see that there is a CPU ID. So we're gonna make another handler for this. I'm gonna kind of put it below just cause it lines up more with my thoughts of where it belongs. And then we're going to get this state. Um, there's a CPU ID context field, this one, which is contained inside of this. So I can do let CPU ID equals unsafe VMX it dot one. And this is unsafe because it's a union and I could potentially be reading unaligned data if I access the wrong union member at the wrong time. So now we have access to the CPID context. Um, so this will allow us inside of, or um, it actually tells you what it wants to return. So these default registers are what it would have returned if it stayed executing inside of the, the hypervisor. So we're just gonna play this through right now and it won't change the behavior at all. It'll just behave as it did before, but now we're getting notified of these things. So what I'm gonna need to do is uh, set the context structures uh, equal to their, equal to these. So RBX, RCX, RBX, I know that's not the actual order. So now I'm syncing the CPID results with the uh, context. And let me see if I need to flush that. I think I do. So I need to call this. This will cause the context to get flushed into box um, because that context will then be used to pick it back up. And I think uh, we're gonna make sure that on CPU CPU ID exits that we don't emulate. So we go back into the hypervisor guest. Technically it shouldn't really matter, but 
this will allow us to keep running that inside of the guest. Uh, oops, racks. Uh, man, if this actually fixes this issue, I'm gonna be really happy because I've, uh, what's going on? Something's broken. Oh, so it's never execute. It's never finishing executing that instruction because it is broken on the CPU ID instruction, and we emulated that CPU ID instruction executing. So we're gonna have to update um, EIP by doing. Where is that at? Exit reason. Is it in this one? No. Is it this. Um, where is it at? I don't think I'm using it at all. Instruction bytes. That's on a memory axis. Exception. I'm really confused. Wait, what? I know I have a way of getting that. We've got this guy. Let me look at the actual header. Because reading these Rust bindings is kind of ugly. Because they don't support bit fields, so everything gets kind of split up in a way that's really hard to read. So we're just going to whack this in some file at some random location and then uh, F12 it. Okay. So we have the VP context. We have the exit reason. We have the VP context. Yeah, that has instruction length. Okay, instruction length. There we go. So we want VP context. Uh, plus equals VM exit VP context dot instruction length, was it? I think that's right. So now we update that then instruction. Uh, yep, and that's, uh, we just have to upcast that. And that's an access to a union. So you gotta unsafe it. Uh, I've been putting the cast inside. Oh, what am I doing? Oh, it's because this is also, because this is reading as well. So I just found this out. I don't know if it's a new change to Rust, but you can, historically, I think you only could access, union fields you only could access in unsafe, but now you can write to them without unsafe because technically you aren't reading anything uninitialized. Okay. So now everything should be booting and working. Of course it should blue screen or, or freeze or do many, many wrong things. Um, or maybe it won't freeze, but it looks like it froze. Oh, no. Yeah, there's the blue screen, okay. And given we're getting a kernel mode exception, that means clearly there's corruption occurring. So it's not simply some like small timing. So now what we can do is match on the, um, we can get the leafs leaves, leaves, out of this, uh, oops, that's MSR. So CPU ID is, uh, I think it's Rax and RDX, or let me make sure I get these right. Yeah, EAX and ECX. So we want leaf will be this CPU ID dot uh, Rax, and then RCX will be the subleaf, I think. Uh, racks and RCX, and those are what are used to select the different CPU ID trees that you that you have. So we want that EAX, and now we can do a. Now that we've loaded up these contexts with the correct states that it would have returned, now we can kind of hook them and make modifications. So this, the let's see, where is that X save? Wikipedia actually has a pretty good listing of all of these. 
So we'll see X save. So OS X save is a dynamic bit that will change based on the OS, which is kind of weird. You'd think that CPU ID is static, but some of them actually come from the state of the machine. But X save is in ECX on, this is gonna be on EAX equals one. So this is leaf one. Then we know we want to clear the uh, 26th bit in ECX. So context dot RCX rig 64 and equals not of bit 26. So disable X save support. Uh, and then we just need to, in other leaves, we just do nothing. So we just pass them through. So this is a union. All right. So now we see that AVX, uh, that XCR0 is staying at one and that's not changing. So we forced the OS to not use um, AVX. And we sync all the SSE instruction, uh, all the SSE context correctly, but we're still getting a blue screen. Damn it. Oh, that's frustrating. What else could we possibly be reporting? I'm trying to think what we might not be syncing or what in the box context might be running. Hmm. <laughs> I could change. Let me add a, a print out to boxes exception handler. This will let me know when Box wants to deliver an exception. Uh, and we're gonna try to see if it's a, oops, if it's a Box-based exception that's being delivered. And then I'm gonna filter uh, if vector is not equal to 14. And this will allow me to not print out when Box wants to deliver a page fault because those happen way too much, and this is C, not Rust. So, I don't know, this is the only major issue I know of. I'm pretty sure it's one thing. Like, I don't think this is, uh, oops, and this is a percent U. But we saw that when this actually exited is when Box delivered an exception. And you'll probably see a, a 13 followed by an eight, which will be a, a general protection fault followed by a, um, followed by a double fault. So I would guess if we don't see an exception from Box, it might execute. So what's probably happening is we're reporting a feature um, maybe inside the hypervisor that, oh, Let's see, in that case, we did not have an exception. Okay. So that means it's not necessarily an instruction being run inside of, uh, in that case it was. In that case, we saw a box delivering a six, which I think is a undefined instruction. Um, and that would mean that clearly this is a, a CPU ID issue, yeah. So invalid opcode. So someone's reporting a feature that the other doesn't support. So they're kind of, this is a, a tricky boat of whose CPU IDs to trust. Do we want to take boxes CPU IDs and run them inside of the hypervisor? Or do we want to take the CPU IDs uh, from the hypervisor and use them in box? So we can do one of those really quickly, is we can set emulating equals 100 and continue. So whenever we try to emulate, or whenever we try and run a CPU ID inside of the hypervisor, we can go into box. Now I prevent this from happening by having the CPU ID handler in box um, long jump out. But what I'm able to do is just disable that code. And now we will always 
uh, run the CPID instruction inside of... Uh, always run it inside of box itself. So now it's gonna use boxes emulated values, which are probably gonna be a superset of what is supported. That's gonna have things like uh, VTX and we'll probably see that almost immediately failing. So what I could do is try to use a weaker uh, processor. So in my config, I can use what is box's weakest hyper? Uh, let's see. We're just going to run this without the quiet flag. Or without the quick flag. So I think this should be able to run Windows, the Core 2 Penryn. So. Core 2 Duo. I'm trying to find the most basic processor that's capable of running Windows. And once we have that, then hopefully whatever platform you're running the hypervisor on will be a superset of those features. Um, so we're going to go into here. We're going to change the our box config to use this model instead. Uh, we're going to make it not reset on triple fault. And then we're going to go into here. And this, we want to make sure that this processor does not report that it has VMX support. So, because we can't have it try to use a hypervisor inside of itself. Let's see what happens here. I think this is just going to fail to boot. Because I think I verify the, yeah. So I just, all I have to do is remove this restriction on the CPU model because we're kind of testing things again. And we'll run this. Because once we fix this blue screen, we should be able to switch between the hypervisor. Uh, okay. So this is saying we got a, this is a triple fault here. Um, box is delivering a GP followed by a double fault. So let's uh, go into here and see where. Uh, sadly, this is a, a frustratingly hard problem to, to figure out. We could maybe just ignore it and take a snapshot and then only run inside of the uh, hypervisor. So in this case, it's trying to read memory. And the only way that you can get a GP when in reading memory is if the instruction is non-canonical. So if this is the address, I mean, technically that's a canonical address. Um, vector E. Isn't E uh, 14? What? I feel like these symbols are giving me the wrong information. Because vector E is a page fault. And why am I printing 13 then? Hmm. Hmm. That's frustrating. Let's see if I, let's see if Windows is able to boot in this environment in the first place. So I'm going to change this emulating here. That caused us to always emulate on every VM exit to not. Let's see what this looks like. I don't know if Windows can boot on this CPU model. Okay, so that's, so there we saw AVX was set to three. That means there's X save support. Yeah. Reported in this processor, so we can get rid of that. That's the last line, so we gotta do that. And then this OSX save. 
So now it no longer reports X save, which should disable AVX. Honestly, what we probably should do is make our own CPU definition in box. Um, I just don't really know how that works. So now we're dying again. It's hard to say why in this case. I could maybe see... Um, hmm. Why would that fail? Why would that blue screen? We're not reporting AVX, uh, FX save. I feel like Windows probably requires this. This might prevent us from being able to boot Windows. I'm not sure. If it doesn't, then that's pretty good for us. It looks like it got stuck, and that's usually a sign. When it gets stuck like that, that's a sign that Windows is blue screening, but kind of silently, <laughs> which is really no fun. But if we were to, I kind of single stepped that out before. Um, in fact, what I probably can do is actually turn on uh, symbols and see where that fails. So I'm going to go and enable coverage. I'm going to comment out the, or uncomment the commenting of that not being supported. And then we'll go to FX save. Uh, so if I comment this out, then hopefully we should actually gather that coverage information of where we're executing. And we should be able to see where Windows is, is throwing a temper tantrum. So this would be really cool. I actually haven't used this coverage stuff in this way before. So it should be stuck. And the way I kind of tell that it's stuck is it's the only thing it's doing is this canceled, which means it's constantly entering the VM and then exiting with nothing to do. So if we look at uh, coverage.txt, oh, did we gather any coverage? It might have failed way too early in the boot process for us to have that info. Oh, okay. All right, we're not gonna be able to use that. That is too early. Oh, that's fucking annoying. Okay. So basically we know that it needs that. So what we can do is look at what Windows actually requires. Um, by loading up one of these, uh, just an NTOS kernel. And we're gonna look through when it actually runs the CPU ID instructions, what it expects. And we're probably gonna be able to set up a exactly the CPU that it that it needs, the bare minimum to run Windows, which hopefully will be less than what it, or hopefully the requirements will be less than that of what we're able to sync, and everything will work, right? Hopefully. So I don't think there's only one location that does all of the checks, but I know at least uh, one specific place where where they check for all of the different CPU ID bits. So we're going to, I was just gonna let Ida finish analyzing here. So KI set feature bits is where kind of all this happens. So we can see it does a lot of CPU ID instructions. Um, so it probably actually is single stepping this whole thing in box. So we have a CPU ID here. It's going to be checking some of the different flags uh, in that. So it's going to save off the EAX, EBX, uh, and EDX values there. R8, okay. So there's one compare that really bites me in the ass. That is this one. So this one is checking the it's about to and the uh, state of one of the, let's see, ECX, which is coming from a CPU ID of 8001. 
from oh it's coming from rsi uh i feel like rcx is volatile how is it where is it getting ecx from here what where is ecx coming from am i am i blind uh da, 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 da. ecx i guess this could return it no that would make no sense why am i so blind i'm pretty sure this is coming from the leaf one and then it tests some other bits and other things i'm so confused because this is derefing it and using it as a pointer. Unless this updates it. That's the cookie. Uh, do I not know x86? Let me uh, let me see what this looks like. Uh, do 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 do. Ki set future bits. Uh, doo, doo, doo. I'm just trying to look up what this code actually does. I, uh, because these are getting clobbered. Like, that's a pointer. Mm hmm. All right. Okay, so feature bits. So. Uh, let's see. There's branch tracing that's used if the CPU vendor is Intel. So that's up here. That will, okay. Exception profiling. Hmm. I don't know if those things are actually being used. CPU ID, pro for read, pro for write, prefetch for write. So here it's like setting up these, um, the like branch trace stuff. So it sounds like if you have an Intel or an AMD processor, we use this branch trace stuff, which I don't think I'm syncing that information because I don't think I have access to it. Uh, that's really frustrating if I need that. Mm. Where is the header? I guess the header got closed. Oh boy, so branch trace I might not be able to sync. And then down here, we're going to do a couple of CPU IDs. We're going to do a CPU ID of 1, a CPU ID of 8 million or 80 million, and then a CPU ID of 80 million and 1. And then we're going to check those to have different, different things. So information standard. Uh, we're going to get the APOC ID and the CL flush. And this is going to be... This is what's required out of EDX. So we can take a look at what these bits are and what Windows is requiring. So it's looking for these in EDX in CPU ID leaf one. So if we look at CPU ID leaf one, this is kind of the standard feature bits of like everything. And this is expecting an EDX that we have an FPU, that we have debugging extensions, page size extension, TSC, MSRs, PAE, MCE, CR, uh, compare exchange eight, an APIC. Uh, we don't need 10. Well, let me look at this because it gives me numbers. Do, do, do. 10 and 11, I don't need. MCRs, PGE, MCA, CMove. 
I'm just trying to look for anything that, for some reason, uh, my hypervisor might not be able to support. So 21, 22, 23, 24. So here we can see that it requires MMX and it requires FXSR, so we can't disable that. Uh, it also requires SSE, which makes sense because on, and SSE2, because on um, all 64-bit processors, it's always supported. Then it also needs syscall support which is done in uh, a different leaf. NX support, Compare Exchange 128, and LAHF. So those are kind of all the features that we need to support. Uh, I don't think we need PCID. Information extended. Uh, FFXSR, if present, enable it, okay. So I think those are all of the things that are absolutely required and everything else is pretty optional. So we can try to create this processor that Windows requires. I'm gonna just move this to a different window and kind of keep that in mind. So it was basically, I think, syscall, no execute, compare exchange 128 and LAHF are the only things that are required uh, from a different, from kind of modern processors. Everything else is very old and would work with a Pentium 4. So we can try to look at, um, I think there's a, an Ocona, nope. What are the different processors supported? Oh, there's a Yona, there's a, well, Matt, because this I don't think has 64-bit. So I'm going to try and find the oldest CPU model that, uh, so that doesn't have LAHF, uh, long mode. Yeah, so this processor doesn't support long mode. Um, so that's out of the picture, this Yona. Uh, long. This one supports NX, but not long mode. Atom N270. Oops, is it N270? Oh, I typed B. So long. This one doesn't support long mode. Prescott. Isn't this fun? <laughs> Let's see. This one does support long mode and NX. So this looks like the oldest processor that supports long mode. In fact, I think Prescott, uh, this was the first long mode processor. We could look that up. Uh, Gonna look that up, uh, not P45, but P4, Prescott. And this is 2004. Uh, it got doubled cache and added SSE3, which is fine. Anything that has hypervisor has SSE3. And I think this was. Intel also released a series of Prescott supporting Intel 64. So this was the first uh, Prescott, this was the first Intel processor that supported 64-bit. So this is probably the best place to start. So we're gonna go and switch over to this processor in our config. And then what we're gonna do is instead of removing features from a more featured processor, we're going to add features to a less featured processor until Windows can boot. So this will be P4, Prescott, Celeron, 336. Ooh. Um, and this is complaining. I uh, can't open file because box is running, of course. So I guess we don't need to build. So now we can run this. This should probably blue screen as expected. So we're now running on some very, very legacy hardware, which is great. 
And this will also prevent Box from running instructions that we don't support. So now both are running. Uh, this should be only a superset of what is supported. And this is really weird. It looks like we... I don't know why we're pausing. Now we're getting canceled. It looks like it got stuck, which makes sense because we don't support everything we need here. So if we kind of look at, uh, let's start with the extended bits that Windows expects. So this is uh, checking all the different extended bits, 11, 20, and 13, which if we look up uh, in 8, 1, I can't remember what registers these are on. These are on, it uh, looks like they vary. EDX is the first two. So this R14 is the EDX leaf, and this is uh, this EDI, I think, is going to be on the ECX leaf. And it should correspond to, uh, we should have syscall, which is going to be 11. So we should see a check for 11. Then we should see a check for 20. For NX, uh, and then 13 over here. Oh, that's uh, that's going to be compare exchange in standard. Where is that at? So 13 compare exchange 16B, and then finally there's going to be a check somewhere for LAHF. So nevertheless, we know roughly what we need to support to get this to continue booting. Uh, this has, this is a CPID leaf one. I feel like this comment is wrong. Oh yeah, that's extended, okay. So this is reporting that we have syscall support. If we're in long mode, then syscall sysret, which is bit 11, which is correct, I think. Yep, bit 11, and then we also needed bit 20 of NX. So this supports NX always, uh, and it supports long mode. What else? Uh, NX, compare exchange 128, we need in And it looks like we have that supported. That's bit 13, which is checked here. And then finally, LAHF. Uh, we need supported. So we're going to actually look at a different processor model for, kind of for reference here. We're going to look at one of the Skylake ones. So there are multiple feature sets. There's what's being reported and what's being enabled. So we have here, this is how we enable LAHF, which is great. So now we're going to add that to, uh, was that the one we were working on? We're gonna close these windows. So now we're gonna support LAHF, which should be bit zero. And then we're going to add, we also need to somehow run this, uh, I say long mode. And this, I think, enables that execution of that instruction will be allowed inside a box itself. So one is what's reported to the guest and one is what will cause exceptions uh, inside a box. So I don't think we're quite, oh, was that all we needed? Okay, so now we're failing. Uh, I don't know why, but this is a, a good state to be in because now we're running on a Pentium 4 with only one feature added. So a very, very, very slight modification to, to Windows, or to this, this processor. And hopefully anything that can run in the hypervisor can run in this. What we might want to do is change that XCR0 maybe to be, hmm. Let's take a look at this again. We're probably gonna have to enable exception exits inside of the hypervisor to see what is causing that fault. And we're getting IRQ less than not equal, I think, right now. Are we always getting the same one? Because if we're getting the same one, then that could be another CPU feature that um, 
Uh, maybe we're not allowing it to get enabled somehow. Maybe we need to spoof out the XCR0. But it looks like it's crashing in the same way, which is great. I, I, like, I like when it's not some random timing. So we're going to go into 132. Or we're going to enable it. exception exits. And now we're going to have a log of all the exceptions as they occur. And further, if I wasn't mistaken, I think we do... We did get the module list. Let's, uh, let's enable coverage again. We might actually be able to see uh, what it's trying to execute, which would be pretty awesome, because that would make this a lot easier. I think I enabled that exception exit, so this might actually hard panic. Uh, yep, there we have some symbols coming through. If I fix this bug, I'm going to be really happy because this is this is the only bug that I know of right now. Okay, so that was uh, that was good. Now I can do code symbol uh, coverage. And this is in linear order of time. So we can see kind of what we were running. Uh, set real time clock. Uh, invoke fast extended hypercall. I wonder if uh, we're reporting that we're in a hypervisor. <laughs> that might be a bit that is set. You can see we're IO load crash dump driver, trace control. So one thing that would be a dead giveaway, well, I guess we're not. How did it detect that we're in a hypervisor? Because we're lying about CPU ID. Start next processor. So what I can do is I can put it into emulation mode a bit more and see if I can get a, a full trace. So what I could do is emulation equals 100 before we check for emulation, which means we're always going to um, we're always going to end up emulating, which means we'll have perfect code coverage. Um, it'll be a lot slower, but now we're no longer using the hypervisor at all. We're bypassing the hypervisor entirely. Um, hopefully this isn't terribly slow, but this will allow us to kind of view, we can see AVX, uh, this XCR0 is set to zero instead of one when we have the hypervisor. So that's one thing we might want to clean out and make sure that that XCR0 never gets set to uh, to one. So I'm gonna go take a quick bathroom break. Um, we're gonna see if this boots, and if this boots, then it means there's clearly some issue between the hypervisor and box. So if it still blue screens, then that means clearly a CPU ID thing is not present. I'll be I'll be back in a minute. All right, so it looks like uh, this is taking forever, probably because our co coverage stuff is too expensive. So this is, um, I don't know, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to uh, speed up the coverage stuff so that we can run this in this mode? We can see right now Box is running at about, uh, what is that? Is that 10? It looks like I'm running about 10 million uh, instructions per second. Ah, this might... Box usually runs at about a 30 to 100 million instructions per second, so this means I'm 
slowing it down a decent amount by by that cost of coverage, but not by a crazy amount. If I disable coverage, we'll be able to see if it boots. We won't be able to get the information of what's happening, but let me just disable that. That's actually a great way to benchmark the performance of the um, the coverage. So we might actually want to continue using that mode. But now we're booting with normal box and full emulation without coverage. And now you can see why we added a hypervisor to box, because this is very, very, very slow. <laughs> very slow. Like this, this is pretty unusable. <laughs> but we just kind of have to see if, if we're able to boot with this processor set up. And I'm guessing that it will be able to boot. And uh, we'll maybe look at the different state differences and, and see if we're maybe enabling things we shouldn't be enabling, like setting that XCR to something non-zero. Hmm. Do, 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 do. Like I don't even wanna wait, but I have to, because this tells me so much if we're able to boot. So how's everyone doing? What's everyone up to? Let's see, I think I had some messages somewhere. I don't know if they were relevant to this stream. Uh, Like, I don't think this is stock. Maybe it is. Ah, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's really hard to say if this is just box being slow or if it's duck and it's like silently blue screened. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Okay, let's uh I wonder if we're losing access to like if the hypervisor is forcing that some leafs are reporting that it's a hypervisor. That would be really frustrating because that would put it out of us, out of our control. Um, oops, what did I change? Did I did I rebuild that? Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't didn't remember. So there's a chance, like. Theoretically, it's possible that it's reporting hypervisor leaves, which is causing it to use hypervisor-like hypercalls. Uh, without, like, whenever you get a CPU ID exit, ideally you get a CPU ID exit for every single CPU ID. But it's possible there's this uh, 40 million range of CPU ID index indices that are used by hypervisors. And it's very possible that the hypervisor might be filling those in and not give me any access to that information. Um, if that's the case, I'm going to be really frustrated because it means this might be actually impossible to do with the limitations of an API like that. I think that's unlikely. So we're still executing. Um, we can kind of take a look at that coverage trace as we're running. And this should be showing us what we're uh, 
doing kind of live if I, I think so, because I should flush that every time. Um, so this is, should be printing all of the, the unique coverage that we're getting. I'm just gonna coverage.txt, reopen that file. So it looks like we haven't gotten past this uh, HAL return to firmware. Uh, okay, add triage, hypercall. It's interesting. I like for some reason this seems coverage lists. Are we? Did we load any symbols? No. So we haven't gotten to the point in the boot process yet that we have. Uh, let's see. Emulated CPU ID. Yeah, we haven't gotten to the point where we have found symbols yet. So I can make a quick performance bypass to this. I can say if uh, if is none return false. So basically, if we haven't found the kernel module list uh, then we will fail right away. Oh, we don't have access to that yet. This borrow is pretty cheap, so this, this shouldn't have too much cost. So now we won't do any coverage until we, uh, let me run that. We shouldn't be gathering any coverage information until we've identified the location that the kernel module lists are at. Now, it's hard to say if Box allows us to run long enough to get to that point. It's possible that it's bug checking or freezing prior to that. So it's kind of hard to say. I'm hoping that I was just slowing down Box way too much with that module list walk. Because this will give us a lot of introspection to what's happening. Come on. It's still doing stuff. When I see like the CPIDs come through, I know that it's still booting and and doing different things. It's not stuck in like a KI idle loop after a panic or a blue screen. But yeah, frustratingly this this issue is not easy to debug. <laughs> so And it's hard to say how much I'm slowing down box by having that even checking whether it's has time for or is in a state where it can co do coverage yet. So I don't know, it looks like it's stuck. Let me uh let's see how fast it is if we use this Skylake X processor. So we can do core i7 Skyly Lake hyphen X. So we're still in emulation mode, so it's fine that we're using this. Um, oops. Sky Lake is under X. There we go. So if this boots or like gets to the the state of the module list, then we know it's blue screening. Um, but you didn't know that Windows can blue screen silently. This is this is what I've been working with for the past few days. Turns out it's pretty hard to debug shit like this when you when you have no idea what's going on. So and we keep scanning for that module list. And if we see that module list come online, then we know that there's something with that other processor that doesn't satisfy a boot requirement for Windows. But I, I doubt that's the case because why would it why would Windows be able to boot with the hypervisor then? Unless the hypervisor is reporting CPU ID stuff that we don't control, which would be really frustrating. It might be that I'm just getting impatient and need to literally wait for two minutes or three minutes to get to the point where where box freezes. 
because I know I know Windows can boot with this Skylake. Um, oh, and this AVX might not be zero. I think we're just not getting to a point where uh, context is being synced that we have access to that register because we're just always emulating, so we never sync that context. So that might not be the issue. Hmm. Let's see. Are there any other issues or tickets I have open? We've got some perf cleanup things we can do. We've got comments and documentation. And then this freezing issue, I think, is the only one that's that's really kicking us in the ass. Um, uh, what am I adding to box that might be slowing it down? I could, I could run box entirely outside of my code. So to do that, I need to make a few changes. Uh, what? Box revisor. And this tick n, I just need to change this. And then in cpu.cc, where we go to enter our code, we're just not going to. And now we're running actual box. Now we're not even running our, um, our code at all. So this should help a lot with some of the performance issues because we're just bypassing our code entirely. And our code is not meant to really emulate fast. You can see now ips is a relevant number. This is the instructions per second we're getting. Um, and you see we're not getting our printouts anymore because we're no longer running our code. So let's see. If we get to the point where there's a pinwheel, then we know that we're making making some progress. Uh, we also have box configured to be uh, 1 million instructions per second. So right now it's running like 50 times faster than real time, but I think that should be fine. It shouldn't really affect anything. I'm just trying to see if, if we're able to boot Windows in this environment. I could also enable the debugger in box to try and see what it's actually trying to execute and where it's getting stuck. That might kind of help. Hmm. It's just really hard to say if it's stuck or what. Like I, I know it should be able to boot with this processor configuration. Uh, don't worry, Barbershopper, you haven't miss, missed anything. I'm trying to figure out what this, uh, what this synchronizing issue is between the hypervisor and box. So right now I'm trying to boot box, or I'm trying to boot Windows in box without the hypervisor at all. I'm trying to see if the CPU configuration I set up works. Um, it might be, did we make modifications to this? Uh, P4 Prescott we did, and we're trying to use this processor. Let's, uh, let's try and set the IPS counter a little bit higher so it won't be like blazing by and yeah, and that's complaining to me now. Oops. We're just disabling these like checks that I had. And what do you mean? Oh, there's another one. We're just gonna do uh, if zero. Just trying to boot box. I don't know what I would have possibly changed internal to box that would prevent anything from working because I'm pretty sure Windows can boot in stock box 
Um, trying to think if there's some other hooks or weird things I've done. Or maybe we're just not waiting long enough. That could be it. <laughs> I might just need to wait a really long time. Hmm. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what to order for food. I'm gonna get some Grubhub. What do you guys think? While we wait, wait for box to boot. It looks like it's changing. The Ips is jumping around, which makes me feel it's not stuck in a halt. So it's probably literally, we just need to wait, which is ridiculous. Um, hmm. Come on. I feel like I've done this before with it not being this slow. I don't think I've made huge changes to uh, to box that would make it slower. I guess I'm also, I also have the stream going, so that maybe hurts perf with the encoding. Probably not too much. I just want to see that pan wheel. Otherwise, I'm going to have to like break into this and see what instructions it's trying to run, which would be kind of annoying. Uh, I don't know. What changes have I made to box itself that would prevent this from working? Let's take a look. Uh, could it be my fault? Oops, that's the wrong project. So what have I changed in box? In box. I've changed things in CPU, things in instrument. I guess I've changed things here. But pretty much, I think only CPU.cc is probably what I'm touching there. CPU.h. Let's let's see where let's see where it's executing. We're gonna debug by breaking into box itself. Uh, where's box? There it is. We know the main thread is there. Oh shit, I disabled the instruction cache. Ha <laughs> ha. Get iCache entry, uh, and then here, boop. That is what was killing my box perf, for sure. There we go, now we're running five times faster. <laughs> now I just gotta remember to re-disable that. Uh, why do I need to disable the iCache? I don't. I don't think I do. I think things are synced enough that I can actually keep that iCache still in there. But now we can see Box is running a little bit faster. <laughs> About two or three times faster, depending on what it's doing. And then we'll kind of see if it gets stuck again. 
but I think I can safely not flush that eye cache. Um. Hmm. I'm not sure. It's hard to say. So we'll see if that eventually starts to boot. Now it should take half the time. Oh, frustrating. I just need to fix this bug. Once this is fixed, then it's all development on finding bugs and fuzzing and snapshotting and restoring. But this one stupid bug is so hard to debug. Come on, boot. Is there anything else I changed? My code's not running. All right, let's take a let's take a little peek again at uh, what it's doing. Sync I count. Yep. Oh, is it halted? Nope, it's running. It might just actually take this long. So this this is how much the hypervisor helps. This is how awful it is. Uh, I just got an exception on a... I think this is fine. Uh, this is saying another 13. So we're getting a few GPs. Is it stuck doing GPs? It's hard to say if it's making progress. Oh, hey, we got <laughs> we've got the slowest boot process ever. Okay. So, ooh, a divide, a div by zero. I don't think that's fatal. I think it's just, uh... oh, it's because I broke into here. Oh, is that div by zero fatal? Now I kind of wish I had that trace. Okay, let's, uh, we're gonna change the configuration here. We're gonna tell it to 10 million ips. And then I'm going to go to our model that we're using, p4prescott-celeron336. So we'll see how fast this one boots. This one should boot faster because I changed the IP setting. So now time passes a little bit faster inside the guest. So timeouts and if it if there's a sleep for a second or something, it will go a lot faster. And I expect I'll see those same that debug break will break me into the uh, into the emulator and I'll be able to kind of poke around and see what's causing those different uh, GPS. Sadly, without a debug build, it's actually kind of hard to figure out what's going on through that call stack. Um, it's hard to say. But... Do, do, do. We could also just completely ignore this bug and then just keep booting Windows until it boots without a blue screen and then take a snapshot and then do fuzzing. It's kind of cheating, but I don't know how boring it is to watch uh, fixing a bug like this. So this one might be stuck because we just changed the processor. So this one might truly be stuck in, in CPUID. 
Let's take a quick look at where we are. Oops, 0k. Uh, this is kind of how the, the call chains look in box. Looks like we are doing stuff. We're also jumping into that coverage thing, which uh, let me just quickly disable that um, that coverage. Uh, was it pre? Hmm. Is it so that we have the ticks going and this? Returns out on halts. We could probably get rid of that. That would help. Where is the instrumentation? Instrument call rep. Instrument call rep. Uh, before execution. There we go. So one of these is ours. I think it's this one, we're gonna go into this and we're gonna change this to do nothing. Now it won't even call into the, the Rust callback, which should help with perf. Once again, we're just trying to make sure that we can get this to boot in box and then once it can boot in box, then we'll, we know we have uh, a comparison. So if if it's booting in box but not booting in the hybrid box and the hypervisor, then we know clearly there's an issue we're causing. So I don't know how much this is going to help with perf. It looks like a lot. So you can see how much that callback is is costing. So now we should very quickly see if we get stuck or not, because it's about five times faster. I'm curious as to why that thread local is so expensive. Um, I guess I'm going to need to kind of play around and see how fast I can get that uh, that coverage function to be. So uh, here we're getting a, a 13. Oops, I can't move that off screen. So we're getting a 13. Um, Couple more 13s, which it seems to be handling. Let me see if I can take a peek into what it's accessing. Uh, I guess we want like this. It's trying to access an address that we don't have. That's kind of frustrating. But eventually, I expect to see that we get that uh, the exception, that div by zero. But we should see. It's really hard to say if these exceptions are an issue. I guess we got them on the other processor. Oh my god. I was hoping we weren't going to get so many. Um. Ah, oh, that's really frustrating. So we're just gonna ignore those. We're seeing it's booting. And then we blue screen, IQ. Uh, we blue screened on a UD, which is good to know. So let me disable that debug break here. And I'm gonna make it now print uh, i64x will be the uh, instruction pointer. And let's give this a go. We'll hopefully be able to see what instruction it's trying to execute. Uh, let me present i64x of... Uh, da -da. Hmm. Uh, read linear. I think it's uh, I 
I'm gonna also print out the instruction bytes. So we're gonna try and grab these. Uh, where are we at? So car buff, 16. Access read linear of rip. We're going to read, I think that's the size, yeah. Eight bytes, at, or 16 bytes of CPL zero into buff. And then we're gonna print uh, time is u in 64 t of buff times buff plus eight. And then we do byte swap. Uh, U in 64, I think, is that. This is the poor man's, um, that's uh, not that. Is it, or did I get my, I think it's complaining about this. Byte swap, is it? Oh man, okay, what did I do? Something stupid, comma, comma these what's it complaining about uh, missing a semicolon <laughs> woo you know, 64t box doesn't have standard int included and I'll just use boxes version that they like to use uh, okay so I think that's right dear if that dear if that plus eight um, it's possible that could deliver a page fault, but I'm guessing that we're never executing an instruction at the very end of a page during an exception. So it's kind of a hack, but this will let me view the instruction that I'm trying to execute in a hex. Uh, and then I'm going to do some really gross stuff with that probably. Um, I'll probably just grep Ida <laughs> for those instruction bytes to try to figure out the base of the NTOS kernel, and then I'll be able to kind of look at Ida where we are. So, I should have done, uh, I should have done a, a dot 08. Yeah, so there we see we have that failure here. We have an undefined instruction with this, with these bytes. So I think we can just use like online disassembler. Uh, yeah. How am I getting an undefined instruction on a, a move? Oh, let me actually make sure this is, oh, that's a, that's a instruction prefix and then a mod RM. We were, uh, this needs to be 64 bit. Uh, oh, nope, it's the same thing. Okay. I didn't know if it would be, uh, let me see if there is, uh, is it just i3d6? Is there an AMD64? What? Is that, I mean, 89 is a move. Oh, RIP is uh, RIP is updated before the instruction executes. So we actually want to find the instruction before this. Man, that's bit me in the ass so many times in box. Um, then I need to add spaces. That's not an NTOS kernel. Let me... I feel like this sequence is probably not unique. Let me go into, I think somewhere I extracted, it might be right in here. I think I extracted the the image so I can grep for this sequence. And you're gonna hate me because I'm gonna just type a bunch of X's right now. So I'm gonna search for 
all the binaries in this ISO for something that has this instruction sequence. And I couldn't find anything. Um, I think it would be in boot.wim, maybe. Let, <laughs> uh, that's in sources, boot.wim. I think this is where the kernel is. Yeah, the kernel is in here. Oh, extract to boot. Oh, this is painful. How many people have debugged in this way before? <laughs> Let's see if we can cheat and get away with searching before it's done extracting entirely. Uh, not quite. I feel like it would be an NTOS kernel. I don't know where else it would be. <laughs> I, it just might not be extracted yet. Let's hope that's the case. There we go, we're starting to see things where it could be, okay. <laughs> Oh, this is so gross. I don't know what a ref SV1 is, but uh, apparently that might be where this code is. <laughs> ref SV, was it in drivers? Yeah. I have no idea what this uh, driver is. I've never heard of it. REFS, REFS is the um, file system, the like new file system. This would be really cool if I like found some bug in Windows where it's using an instruction that's not in the CPU ID list. So now we're going to grab this, which is the same string. We're gonna search for it and we find it and it's running a CRC32 before. That's really interesting. So Windows executes a CRC32 instruction without checking whether or not that instruction is present. So we, hey, we found a bug. <laughs> you came for fuzzing and we get manual bugs that don't really matter. But uh, that's actually really interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh let's now we can uh now we can tweet that out how, how do we how do we tweet that out apparently apparently windows 10 uses the cpu ID, uh uses the crc32 instruction without checking the cpu id lame no nah, we won't do that uh that it's present Unless I'm lying, let me let me double check before I make these accusations. But uh, CRC32, uh, what are those in? Those are part of which instruction set? Are there not flags for it? Maybe, is there no way to detect that? Uh, they must be SSC like 4.2 maybe. Let's see. What instruction set did these come in? SSC 4? Yeah. So SSC 4.2 added the CRC32 instruction these were implemented in Nehalem. Does uh, Windows requirements? Let's see if I can find feature requirements. Uh, SSE, no. Windows 10 SSE requirements. 
trying to find like where we actually mention it. That seems like ZNet. Um, so Windows 17, let's just say whatever the latest thing is. Uh, up through the following, wait, what? Where's the minimum requirements? Minimum. Minimum requirements for Windows 10 for desktop. x86 and x64, PAE, NX, and SSE2. Compare Exchange 16B, LAHF, Prefetch W. This, but it's using an SSE 4.2 feature. So that's kind of interesting. Um, let me see if I am reporting that I support that, which I doubt I am. Uh, what is my CPU model that I'm using? I think I still have it open, maybe? Yeah. SSC. This is saying I have SSE three. I've got SSE two, but I don't have SSE four. So those are just the comments, but I don't actually have it. So uh, Windows SSE four. Do <laughs> SSE two. Like I don't see where they mm. I <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm seeing this where it says you need SSE two to run Windows ten. But then I'm seeing it use unconditionally uh, CRC32 instruction. I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that just slipped past testing. But CRC32 is pretty modern. That's Nehalem. So let me, uh, let's see. Windows 10 requires SSE2. Boot Windows 10, but uncon. Uses CRC32. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, uh, this is SSC 4.2. Let's see if anyone knows this. Blue screen with the UD2 if you try to. That sound coherent? Uh, to boot when it's 10, but unconsciously. I feel like there might be someone who actually knows that so but i mean that's exactly what we're seeing the only way it could be doing that is if it's actually running the the uh cpu id instruction um let me see let me uh, look at this code quick I wouldn't be surprised if we have like nothing testing Windows on a lesser processor than than this. So let me find. I'm just taking a quick look at this uh, this code to see what it's uh, CRC CMS CRC32. MS initialize because uh, REFS is pretty new. Oh, if Process support CPU uh, CRC32. 
Is it? If it is non-zero, then we go here. I'm really confused because it looks like it has a software implementation. Is this bit getting set incorrectly? Uh, otherwise, there's some like really weird shit going on. But I feel like I'm lo I'm looking for where this uh, where this code is. <laughs> uh. Um, <laughs> okay, so if we look at this instruction, we'll see that, uh, if we look at this, we see it's defined as one. It's just already defined as one. <laughs> so it's all, it's always defined as CRC32 supported. There is a place where CRC can be disabled, but, uh, uh, yeah, uh, kind of hard to get there. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I think, uh, I think that might be wrong. <laughs> let me, let me get blame this. I'm curious when this is added. This might be this might be busted. <laughs> that that looks that looks wrong to me. <laughs> Let's see. I mean, I can I can tweet about the name of the symbol because uh, it's not the bit is just always set to one in. Refs v one dot sys <clears throat> seems a bit broken. Okay, so that's just a public symbol. So there's really nothing crazy about that. So that's just always gonna pass the test. So I guess the way we handle this problem is. Uh, I guess we just have to add SSE 4.2 to this processor, which is frustrating because I don't want to have a Nehalem dependency. That being said, you're not going to have a hypervisor or a pre-Nehalem. So let me find, we need, uh, or is it uh, SSE, SSE 4.2 added CPU ID, right? Or the, ah, uh, CRC32. Yeah, so we need to go up to SSE 4.2 just because of that one fucking instruction. Ha, oh, you assholes. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look. We're already pretty close. So we're gonna look at Skylake SSE 4. And we're gonna see how it enables everything. So that's gonna enable uh, 4.1 and 4.2 here. So we're gonna, after SSS, E3. We're going to enable those two. Um, and technically, that should probably cut it. This should be able to let us boot, because it's not checking CPU ID for those instruction, or for, for the presence of that. So, that's interesting. It looks like we have a, a currently broken dependency on, uh, on SSE 4.2 in Windows. So this should allow that instruction to run without a, a fault. Which would show why we were able to boot this in the hypervisor, but not in the, um, in the emulator. Because we must have run that instruction coincidentally while we were executing in the uh, hypervisor context. So that's kind of fun. So we'll see. Yep. Now we're uh, now we're getting to the pinwheel, and we're no longer getting. Uh, we got the div by zero, which I don't think mattered. Maybe it did. <laughs> Does the div by zero matter now? This is good. We're learning. Let's uh, let's report that we actually support these features. 
Um, is it just in that one location? SSE 4, 1 and 4, 2, and then down here, SSE 4A, which we don't report. So we'll just go up to this, we'll steal these, and uh, SSE 4 and SSE 1. Okay, so we've added those, so now we support those instructions. And now let's report that we support them as well. Uh, we'll do it right here. Let's make sure the comments line up as well. This should be, we've got bit 19 and bit 20, and this says, yep, bit 19 and 20. So now we're reporting those. And then this one, we didn't have it reported anyways. Ugh, okay. Guess we can close these. So that seems like a like an actual Windows bug. So there we go. We we found uh we found the world's most pointless bug. I mean, I guess technically, I I don't know. I feel like someone maybe is installing uh, Windows on a pre Nehalem processor. Maybe not. Is it Nehalem or Nehalem? How do you pronounce that word? I don't know how to read IPA. Ne Nehalem, I think. A isn't about. Ne about Nehalem. Hey, I don't, I don't fucking know. Okay, so that got the that div by zero, which seems to have killed it. Let's uh, take a look and see if we can figure out where this div by zero is. Uh, oof. We're hacking. Is this, is this what computers are? This is probably going to be in a lot of places. Well, it's an NTOS kernel. Okay, we can, we can work with NTOS kernel. Let me make sure I have the right version loaded up. Silver Searcher versus Rip Grip. I have never heard of Rip Grip. Silver Searcher is where it's at, though. I, I fucking love Silver Searcher. KE init AMD64 specific state. Okay. I like that. <clears throat> well, let's, uh, let's see if it lines up with the address. This is saying at C24, a uh, 7C24. I'm gonna guess that that is what we hit. So we'll uh, let Ida analyze. I'm gonna use the restroom again. I'll be right back.
All right, let's take a quick look at this rip crap. I know burnt sushi. Fast than grep egg, get grep. Uh, usability of the silver searcher and the at clone, yep. Raw performance of genie grep. Oh, this is awesome. Okay. Okay. Code search, benchmarks. I'll, uh, I'll take a look into this. Wow, this documentation is fucking nuts. Holy shit. Nothing. Well, uh, we'll, uh, I'm gonna bookmark that so I make sure I install that. that. That looks awesome. Thank you. See, that's the great thing about doing streams is you learn just random stupid shit. Not saying that's stupid. Just random things that you probably wouldn't encounter unless you were looking over someone's shoulder or working with someone. So here we can see we're doing a CDQ, which is a sign extension, uh, and then we're dividing by R8. Uh, this is... Compare, safe mode. So uh, if it's non-zero, so we're in it safe boot mode checking for a debugger and what are we we're ultimately dividing by this which is subtract with borrow on itself is basically just checking the carry flag i think um from this what the fuck is this doing i'm just gonna look at the code i'm i really don't <laughs> want to reverse right now so Uh, oh, this is like uh, written in assembly, I guess. Maybe. I just ordered some Thai food as well, so I'll be able to eat. Okay, this code is... Where is this code written? Hmm. Uh... I don't know. Like, is that div by zero fine? I'm curious if that's causing... I mean, obviously it's a div by zero, which is delivering an exception, but it's hard to say. It seems like it's executing for a bit past that. I don't know if that's where execution ends or if it maybe handles that. I don't. It could be in a try catch. I think it's unlikely in the boot process. Um... It could also be that time's going too fast. I might need to put this in our uh, real-time mode. If this is doing anything with time, I could see that being an issue where like time is skipped. Uh, debugger not present. I th think these exceptions are maybe fine. <laughs> But we're like, we're continuing after that point, and then we fail there. It's very strange that we're blue screening. I guess you can blue screen without an exception. That exception might be fine. Uh. Oh. Is it? Oh, this is KPP. How did you already fucking know that? That's like a really random thing. <laughs> uh... <laughs> that feeling when we're reversing patch guard on stream. Let's uh, let's put this to uh, 200, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So now we're going to be running at more of a, a normal execution speed. I mean, it it could be KPP. I I could see that I could see that with the time being synced off by so much. So we're gonna kind of sync up that time a little bit more. Um, it's also possible it's using other CPU features that it's not 
not checking. We could go to an Ahalem based processor. I think there is an Ahalem in their uh, CPU list. Uh, maybe not. Let's see, uh, i7. I wanna kinda be watching this. So these G GPs are kind of interesting. Like, are these issues? We had that. And we still blue screen. Um, how does that work? That could be how it's entering the KPP state. Uh, let me let's take a quick look at uh, some of these and also change this format string to be correct. So we want to make this uh, dot sixteen i sixty four x. So now we'll. Now we won't have these different length ones because that dropped to zero in the middle of here, which would make it hard to look that up. So I'm just gonna take a quick look at what these GPs are coming from. Uh, I know this is gonna be an NTOS. Like, I was actually really surprised when we saw a crash in something other than NTOS. Holy shit, that is not a unique instruction sequence <laughs> oh okay we're gonna assume it's an entos what are we doing here we're uh keep in mind it will be the instruction before so we're looking for this is 8BEA, so this one's, we're looking for something at 7A1. I don't know how rare this sequence is. This is very, this is a very common prologue. There's just no way this is gonna, this is gonna work. Oh, 7A1. <laughs> do you think, do you think this is the one? <laughs> or do you think we just got, it's just a complete coincidence? How far are we through the binary? I feel like I feel like that's probably just a coincidence. Let's try and find a more uh, uh, uncommon instruction. Like this is very strange. Let's go to the very first one, an EB10. Like these with a NOP are very. They, they stand out a lot to me as as what. Why are we executing a, a NOP? But we're gonna go to the very first one in case it caused a cascading issue. So, uh, EB, so we've got a jump at least. We've got a relative jump. And hopefully that relative jump makes it a little bit more unique because there's now an offset. And Does this code a, this that make a mistake here? Let's look for this one. Oh, do I need to do AI? There we go, NTOS kernel. Oh, it's <laughs> like what are we executing outside of a of a module? Where, where is this code coming from? There's one there, KE verify, that is failing on, that is at F4, which means this is the instruction that's causing a fault. Uh, KE verify except zero, that sounds kind of, kind of interesting. I'm curious if that GP is, is fine there. Otherwise maybe uh, racks got clobbered. So this ki exception verify fault, and this does a try accept. Uh, this function verifies the behavior of nested exception dispatching. So I think this is intentionally supposed to cause an exception. So that one checks out. Uh, this one's probably going to be uh, ki verify accept one. If we look, it's probably just this. 
FA9, yep. And then we've got E21 here. So let's take a look at this, because this has a NOP. I guess that's probably padding in a loop. Uh, well, we now know the base of this. So we can take uh, this subtracted by this is that. So now we can take any address and subtract that from it. Keep in mind, this is ASLR, so we can't just hard code this and reuse this in future ones. So let's take a look at one of these NOPs. Take this, subtract off this space address. And now we can go here, and yep, there's that NOP. So this is K, I accept, verify. So these all look to be very similar in location. Let me uh, take a look at this one. Okay, this is like a bunch of exception verifies, and then we can grab this address, which is the div by zero. Verify that is, yep, so we were right about that location. So then we run these CPU IDs. I'm guessing I'm hitting a, a KI bug check. Um, so... <laughs> You guys ready to do some hacking? <laughs> we're we're going to do some shit. We're going to take this address. We're going to subtract this address to give us this address. Then what we're going to do is we're going to bit 64u latch adder so 0 static. If not latched adder then latched adder is equal to RIP minus this. And now we can say Ida i64x. Uh, we'll do an OX. And then we'll take rip minus latched adder. <laughs> there we go. We got our ASLR bypass. <laughs> Uh, and let's make sure, yeah, that we have that in if. So we know that we're gonna run into that exception first. Box is deterministic, so we don't need to kind of, we don't, in the emulation mode, so we don't have to worry about it. So now we have kind of an ASLR break. <laughs> so we should be able to go now directly to these things with the IDA address instead of, and it will update every time we reboot, which means we'll then be able to apply a breakpoint on K okay, bug check. <laughs> and see how it gets there. So, it's a little, uh, little kludgy. There we go, so let's uh, verify that that looks correct. Okay, yep. And then we should see that div by zero, and the div by zero is here. Uh, whoop. Oops, I grabbed the wrong address, this one. There we go, okay, so now, now we can get past that. So, oops, that terminal just disappeared. Okay, box. This, this is like a weird bug in Windows where for some reason the terminal like freezes, it no longer takes mouse input, but it does if you like manually click on it. Uh, box. Uh, so now what we can do is go to K, KI bug check. Uh, is it this one? Mm, double fault, service handler. Um, that's going to go to bug check EX. That's what we want. This one will get called all over the place. Yeah. Okay. So what we'll be able to do is then add a breakpoint on this address to try to figure out what's going on. So once we get, uh, once we resolve that base, we can then convert from Ida to there using, do I just add it? <laughs> 
equal to ox this, which is the ida address. Um, and then I'll add latched adder. And now I can do access. Ooh. I can't write to that memory because it's probably not writable. Oh, right now I'm just debugging. Um, but I'm working on a hypervisor that integrates with Box for uh, finding bugs and code coverage. So you can find this tool. It's all open source. Let me github.com. So you can find the code here and a little bit about it. So, but right now I'm debugging uh, uh, some obscure issues that I have no idea what they are. So this bug check, it's kind of hard to say uh, what's happening here. I'm rip RIP on exception. Let me check to make sure and CPID. Let's make sure I'm not breaking this RIP. We're not changing that. We're then running that. So, hmm. I'm curious what we're possibly bug checking on. How many instructions are we executing? We're running about 100 million per second, which is, I'm trying to figure out the best way for me to get a trace out of this. I could, I, like, I, I can't just directly write a breakpoint over that. Uh, could I add a hardware breakpoint? Maybe I could do this. There's the debug, the parser, or breakpoint match. Code breakpoint. Shit, what is the best way to figure out what I've been doing up until that point? Hmm. The coverage stuff, I think, was slowing us down too much. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, this is tough. I don't know the best way to try to debug this issue right now. Um, let's, let's use our CPU loop again. Let's get rid of this. Because I think I can do ips equals a million again, and we should be fine. This will now keep it in sync with, with real time. Uh, I don't have the hook for coverage, which is fine. So it's still only emulating, but now my, my stuff is running as well. Let's see how bad it is when I add the coverage back in. That is an instrument.h. I feel like this is going to kill perf too much, but I really want to somehow get this coverage information. And then I want to enable the coverage in lib.rs. Coverage disable is false. Good. Okay, so. Let's see how much slower this is. I think we we're getting 250 million. Maybe it was just the caching stuff. Cause this is calling, this is calling my stuff. And I th I'm curious if we'll get to the point where modules get resolved. So this isn't terribly bad. This might be four times slower 
but if we can get symbols out of this and coverage out of this, then that will be awesome. Because then we'll see an approximate trace of what hit it, hit this. So. Uh, do, do, do. It's also syncing with real time. So hopefully that helps if there was some weird timing issue causing the blue screen. I doubt it though. Maybe it is actually four times slower. Is it gonna take four minutes instead of one minute now? Oh no. Hopefully we only have to do this once. Come on. I'm looking for those, uh, looking for those exceptions, the, the ones that will print out a lot. It'll kind of show us we're making progress. I have no reason to believe that my, oh, I might need to change that tick N. That's probably breaking everything right now. Uh, tick in. Let me just look at my diffs. Uh, I really need to make sure that's on git ignore. Was it boot? Boot dot whim and windows. Boot. Boot dot whim. There we go. Okay, so we have made changes. So here we can undo discard changes to that. Uh, this is CPID, which is fine. Trying to get it back into a, a good state. This Skylake model is fine. This iCache, I think it's okay for me to use the iCache. And then here we'll just... Uh, I think it's only that one change, and that should put us back. Okay. I'm hoping I can use the instruction cache. I don't see a reason why I couldn't. Let me... Once this is running, we can take a look at where that instruction cache is updated. It was bug fixes from the start. I pretty much just started toying around with some perf things for the coverage and then immediately found out that we were getting blue screens a decent amount of the time. So, and this is the only issue that I still have remaining. So, yeah. So I'm just trying to figure this out. Once this issue is fixed, then literally all the dev time will go into perf and improvements and fuzzing and coverage and feedback. Um, I think it's it doesn't crash enough that we could do some of that, but it's a it's a little iffy. I'm gonna be right back one time. And just a heads up, oops, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, a heads up that this bug is probably gonna be like really lackluster when we find it. It's probably gonna be really obvious and really stupid. But right now we just have no introspection into the execution of the guess, so we have no idea what's going on. <laughs> so hopefully this will give us maybe a trace, so it, it will, we'll be able to see the unique path to the bug check. Um, it doesn't look like the bug check is happening due to an exception. It looks like the bug check is happening probably due to some check or assertion failure. And hopefully that assertion failure is really obvious. Hopefully it's like, oh, check to make sure the processor has support for this feature. And it's like, oh, we don't. Okay, obvious, fixed. Uh, and then we just add that. 
the hard part is we just have no idea what it's trying to get. So this boot process might take a while, um, but I, I think I pretty much just have to wait this out. <laughs> it's that or I'm just gonna start guessing and trying random shit. So it looks like uh, we're starting to make progress in the boot. We're probably about a uh, third of the way there, so it's probably another five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> I could maybe try and find a way to make my coverage stuff faster. We can also take a look at this uh, iCache stuff. Okay, so those are the exceptions. Hopefully we can find the module list because we need to find that if we want to get any coverage. Uh, but we might be crashing before we get that, in which case this method won't work at all. Please. Please. Yeah, it looks like we're gonna we're gonna blue screen right about now. And we don't really have a reason why. <sighs> Fuck, that's frustrating. Let me see if I can very quickly get in this. Okay, so we're still in the blue screen. This is gonna be really gross. Uh, okay. So we happen to break while we're writing to the console. That's pretty crazy that we happen to be there. I'm gonna put uh, I'm gonna put a breakpoint here. Really? How did I not hit that? Come on. I'm trying to find uh, what is causing that. How am I not able to get execution here? Let's see if I can view, ah, fuck, fuckity fuck. What can I do, what can I do, what can I do? Okay, I think we're going to add our own extra code coverage. I guess that can bypass mine. So we're gonna go into um, we don't want that. We want this. We're gonna undo that. We're gonna put that back. I'll disable coverage again. Uh, I think this will boot much faster because we won't be doing that coverage callback every time. But then, I think we're gonna be able to Okay, so this should hopefully boot a bit faster. We'll keep an eye on that. But what I'm gonna do is in that exception, we have this base address. I'm gonna put that in a global. And that is how I'm figuring out what ASLR looks like. And then once that address latches, then, so I can do, uh, in instrument.h, we can do uh, extern latched address. If latched adder, then we can do, uh, we can also do an extern file times coverage, and we can do an f printf to coverage, if latch adder, and coverage, uh, we can print i64x of the rip minus latch adder. So, right, we're gonna subtract off that address, that will give us the address inside of the NTOS kernel that will write it out to the file, uh, coverage. 
we also need to open that file and create this this extern. So we'll do that here. Doesn't need to be static. Uh, coverage equals fopen test coverage dot text and uh, open it for right binary. Make sure we have a new line. We do. Okay, and then we'll also put a print here. Uh, found base of uh, and toss. Kind of, uh, one second, my food's here. All right, so this will now give us, uh, hopefully it will start telling us, uh, once we get this first exception, we'll record the base difference from Ida, and then we'll start gathering coverage information to a file in the form of Ida addresses that we can then uh, use Ida symbol resolution to figure that out. So this is a really quick hack of trying to get single step tracing and the perf might be just unbelievably slow, but we'll uh, we'll see what happens. I'm going to go into cpu.cc. I'm going to undo these changes so that we're using normal box again and we'll undo this as well. And then we'll rebuild. So this will boot it as fast as possible using box emulation. Once we figure out that that base of that DLL or of the kernel, then we'll be able to start gathering coverage and hopefully we don't have to execute that many instructions. Otherwise we'll have to use a, a map and kind of reduce down the the information to only give unique branches. Hmm. I didn't order brown rice with my food, but I got it. All right. So let's see. I'm going to be muting my mic every once in a while to uh, take a few bites of food. We're just waiting for it to boot anyways. All right, in theory, we're now collecting coverage information. This, uh, <laughs> it's quite slow, but hopefully we can observe. We'll be able to see a full trace of, of what's being run. We might need to, uh, uh, I don't know. I have no idea how long it's going to take to execute until the blue screen.
So I'm going to let this sit for just a little bit while I eat. And if it doesn't make any progress, then we'll add uh, some deduping of the coverage log to try and cut down on the cost of, of saving those coverage instructions. Uh, we could also have the coverage not start until the div by zero to give us a little tighter range, but it looks like we've completely destroyed our, our perf here, so. All right, as much as I want to eat, this is not this is not going to work. So we're going to make this coverage unique, and we're going to do this very, very, very quickly. Um, so we now have that IDA address that we've computed. First, let's take a look at this log. Um, what do we call it? Test coverage? Yeah, that's already a 600 meg file. <laughs> I don't think I have head type. Yeah, uh, I could, hopefully this can control C. Yeah, so we can see, I just have a full trace of all of these addresses. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna say, um, bit 64u ida adder is rip minus latched adder. If ida adder is greater than or equal to this, oops. Uh, greater than or equal to this, and ida adder is less than this. So we're going to bound it to this module. Then we're going to print it, but we're going to do more. We can now, we're going to have a, uh, okay, then we're going to have a extern uh, bit u coverage bitmap and we just gotta declare this over uh, exception coverage bitmap is null coverage bitmap equals malloc how big is this file calc this minus this 9 million so let's do 16 megs and here we also want to make sure we have the coverage bitmap and if we do if coverage bitmap of the ida adder minus uh, bit 64u offset equals ida adder minus the base. If that is zero, we don't want a malloc there. We want calic. So this will be zeroed out, the coverage bitmap. If it has not been observed before, then we'll print it. And then we'll update that it's been observed. And it, I know it's not a bitmap, but it doesn't matter. We don't really care about memory. Uh, missing some semis. I probably should just look at where it's telling me there is. 
189. Missing a curly brace, because that and that. So let's see. We'll compute the IDA address. We'll compute the offset. We will bounds it. We will then, if it hasn't been covered before, we'll print it. And then we'll update that we've covered it. So this should now, uh, can't cast 845. Yeah, right now we're testing it on Windows. Uh, right now we're finding bugs in our own stuff. We have issues in our own code. So we're not actually finding bugs in Windows. Although what we're doing right now is very similar to bug finding in Windows. And we did find a bug in Windows. So hopefully perf doesn't go through the floor. I'm gonna mute for a second again. All right, so that might have worked. We had two new exceptions, but we were also running at a really weird speed because we weren't syncing with real time. So I'm not going to think too much of that. I'm going to assume that's like uh, additional context switches, but we're probably having the same crash. Um, I'm going to make a copy of that file. Uh, copy test coverage. Um, parse me dot text. And then I'm going to run it again with a more realistic CPU speed. Um, <clears throat> so that time doesn't like teleport ahead and then we'll just run it again. And this will, this will hopefully make it, uh, a bit more of a realistic trace, but we can start working on the IDA script to, to parse out this information. Let me, let's see. So the format of this file that we have is pretty simple. Um, they're just all the IDA addresses of the memory we touched, or of the instructions we executed, excuse me. So we should be able to see that these, this is not a trace. It's important to note that this is not a trace. Uh, this is a list of unique things we executed. So, uh, oh, we're looking at, yeah, now it's updating. So now it's running, it's not like pinwheeling super fast. So we should see the same issue here. There's the blue screen without the exceptions. So now this is the one we're gonna use because this is a, a little bit cleaner of a trace. So, so we can load this file. Oops, we reloaded it and we, let's see where we ended up. Uh, yeah, so the last instruction we saw executed was uh, BGP FW display bug check screen. And that sounds about right. So we're gonna write a very quick IDA script. Um, and we're just gonna do it in gvim testing.py. This is going to trace equals open. I'm gonna grab this so I don't type it wrong and test coverage dot text rb i guess we can just do r and then four line in trace dot split lines is it print line let's make sure that's right 
Uh, split underlines? Is it lines? What the fuck is it? Oh, this is a dot read. Okay, so now we have this and we can say adder equals the int of this is int 16. And now we can print, uh, Ida has a way of getting the offset, uh, funk off, funk offset. Uh, da, 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 da. What is it? Does anyone know what the function offset thing in Ida is off the top of your head? Op off. Get funk offset. There it is. It's weird that that doesn't show up in the in the results. So now we can print uh, coverage covered percent s mod adder. And I'm just gonna do output is equal to. We're gonna take this same path uh, out wb and output dot right the new line and then output dot flush output dot close. All right. Let's see if this works. And this should tell us kind of what happened. Sorry, I'm just eating food. So it looks like we're hitting a page fault that is unrecoverable, which is interesting. I don't know what's causing that that page fault. So this is ki page fault here. Let's take a look at the first location where we had. Um, all right, guess. Hmm. Then the access fault, query processor relationship here. This is one of the last things we saw. Uh, okay, and then that jumped back up and that looped. Okay, I active groups. Okay, maximum groups, maximum processor. Um. Huh, one second. I'm gonna eat a little bit more, sorry, thinking about this. I'm guessing that I'm reporting the um, processor number as a different number than, no, but I'm running everything in box. I don't know, one second.
so I'm guessing this is doing some processing of the like processor grouping and maybe ACPI information. I don't know why Box is giving the wrong information. So I'm gonna add page fault um, prints as well because I'm currently blocking those. <clears throat> so we're just gonna always do this block. And I think, let me see if page faults, I'm guessing on page faults, I probably, oops. Hopefully on page faults, CR3 is, or CR2 is already set, so I can print out the faulting address. Holy shit, this is really spicy. <laughs> okay, let's see, maybe just 14. Exception G P U D D E N M So B X uh, P F There we go. That looks good. CR2 is linear address. Perfect. So we can just grab that CR2 and print that off. Uh CR2 is gonna be X percent I six four X. That is before the IDA address. So here, I don't really care about the code formatting because this code's all gone in the trash. We're probably gonna figure out what the bug is, do a git reset hard, and then uh, <laughs> run everything again. Or like fix the specific issue. So now we'll get to see the CR2 and we'll be able to observe page faults. Uh, and that might screw us over for our addressing. Uh, huh, one second.
<sighs> I think I've been talking this whole time and I did, forgot I was on mute. Sorry. I was just switching the processor to uh, a different one to see to see if we're going to get the same issue here or if it's a CPU ID related thing. And it looks like we're getting a different thing. We're getting a div by zero. Oops, wrong one. This time, zero node pages, RID. That's really strange. Query node active affinity. So once again, this is kind of related to like NUMA node CPU topology stuff. I... What could possibly cause this? So it's faulting in this stuff. This is fine. This is just like a... Yeah, it's doing a mem set. So here it's zeroing something out. That's fine. Nothing out of the ordinary there. This is uh, allocate. But this one stands out. But it's interesting that we're crashing in a, in a different way. Let me uh, do this one more time. All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna try and see if this uh, this one's any different. It looks like there's a... So the actual exception handles happens here. Yep. And then we hit this divide error fault. We decode it. So there's like something that must be handling this div by zero. Preprocess fault, thread startup. Uh, I have no idea what this is. KE bug check and thread startup and KI preprocess faults. Okay, check for ATL. Check for ATL funk. And we probably hit this. It's hard to say without a without an actual trace. Check for safe execution. Here's what we can do. We can maybe try, we can see what happens if we try to write an actual trace. So we had that issue before, but we can maybe change this into a binary format and get rid of the flush. So, 
shit, how do you comment in a... There you go. Okay, so I can do, instead I can do an F right of, shit, I always get this ordering mixed up. I think it's buff, yeah, buffer and then count, okay. So we're gonna write out the Ida adder and then it's eight bytes and we're gonna write it to coverage. So now maybe maybe we can do an actual trace and see what happened better. But I, I just don't know why we're divvying by zero in the first place. I think I think comments don't work like that. Yeah. I have no idea why that did by zero is happening. I don't think I'd do anything in, in box that would cause box to behave any differently. So let's see what happens. All right, so that shows that we uh, we now have <laughs> we now have a seven gig trace of every instruction that was run. Shit. <laughs> yeah, see you later, barber shopper. Well, that kind of sucks because that's a uh, <laughs> that's. An, that's not a very reasonable size file to process. Son of a bitch. Oh my God. I just want it to be easy. Let's try some different CPU models. And I'll disable this coverage stuff for now. Oh, why is this so hard? We'll try a few different CPU models and see if one of them magically works. Otherwise, I, maybe we'll try stock box. I don't, I don't know what I would have changed in box. Uh, let me try Haswell. Hmm.
I have no idea what I possibly have broken in box. Unless the box configuration is so sensitive. I'm... Mm. Well, this might be the, the, this might be a lot more obvious once we figure this out. <sighs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I just can't fucking boot windows and box. Uh, let me, uh, I guess we're gonna have to try actual box. We're gonna... We're going to... Try out an official build a box. And make sure we didn't break anything. Whoops. Because it's possible that we, we just broke something in box. Um, where is it? Balance page 269. Uh, we want just the normal <coughs> exe. <laughs> I love their secure code in the blue screen. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I've actually never scanned it. I, I'm guessing it's probably the, I wonder if that tells you the like fault codes, uh, Probably gives you the fault code and maybe the exception infos. I'll, I'll, uh, next time I'll try and scan it with my phone, see what happens. Okay, so we installed box. So now we have actual box. And I'm just gonna make sure that that's the one we use. And of course there are quotes in the name. So now we're running the exact same box configuration we were, uh, Plug-in control. Uh, Plug-in control. So the uh, this box is a little bit older. The official one. Plug-in control. Which one is on? What's unrecognized here? What if I called? Why? Why don't I see what it is? I don't know what is wrong here. I know box switched to using ones instead of trues. I wonder if that's the issue. If this works, then uh, yeah, it is. So this box is a lot older. So I'm actually gonna have to go and build. Yeah, you can see this is 2017 is their latest official release. So, we're just gonna build box from source. Um, ugh. Let's go to this one. This is kept up to date four days ago. Um, and we're just gonna have to build stock box. And we're just gonna have to run it and see if it boots. There's a chance, there's a chance that box itself has broken something and we're debugging a box issue right now, which would be pretty frustrating. So I'm gonna need to use a Sigwin window. I'm gonna go to uh, C, Sig drive C, dev stock box box, box again dot com dot uh, win 32 vcpp uh, why did my git convert those dos to unix on dot com dot 32 vcpp what what this is just lf Whoa. Uh, this is new to me. I guess, oh, configure itself is also screwed up. Uh, 
Oh, this is fucking stupid. Why is my... Why is... Hmm. How do I set that uh, git? I want this out of CRLF. Let's see what my git config is. Uh, I feel like I have auto CRLF is false. Input is the third option, true, false. Like I, I think I think Git's just doing some dumb shit. Cause I've never had this issue before. Did it print? Did Git print? It was like converting line endings. Uh, so let's see what this global config says. Yeah. So auto CRLF is. I wonder if that's default now. Yeah, that's so stupid. Why does that exist? So, sadly, building box is single-threaded by default. I made some changes to make it build multi-threaded, but we're gonna just have to build it the good old-fashioned way, because I'm trying to make sure that I do everything exactly as intended. So I want to have a nice stock environment. This might not have all the CPU modules that we need. So I might have to change that as well. But they have box box BIOS latest. Unless the BIOS is bad. Um, while that sounds stupid, all of the issues we've seen have been like div by zeros with respect to the... Um, like ACPI processor tables. So there's a chance that the BIOS has changed in a, in a bad way. So I can, once this is built, I'm gonna use stock everything. I also might need to reconfigure and rebuild box to support all of the features that we need to support to, to have the right processors. So I think by default, um, Uh, any 2K vmix 2, all optimizations. I, I'm not sure if this will support all of the uh, the CPUs we need, but we'll see. Yeah, the build kind of sucks. <laughs> so we should have a box.exe. I am going to actually take that box.exe and I'm going to replace that one. And now we're using the same config, uh, CPU directed malformed. So let's just reset these back to their defaults. And this I think makes sense because I think that CPU is not supported. So if I do this, we'll be able to see what? I gotta go back a directory to quickly see. We can do this, we can do a Sandy Bridge 2600K. Uh, uh, Sandy Bridge. So we'll have to try the original, or our custom version as well, because now we're changing the CPU version. But let's see. So now we're running completely stock box. Uh, that, ah, uh, fuck. Well, we're gonna have to reconfigure, I think. Box, uh, stock box is supposed to be 32 bit. So let me go do that then. 
Sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's this reporting? So we'll go exit that. We'll do a open another one of these. Siglin, Siglin, CD. Uh, dev. So I got to do CC equals CL dot IG. This should fix that issue. building for i586 and hopefully we should see yeah unsigned long is four bytes so that's good I'm gonna all clean it again and build it so now we're building the 32-bit version There's a lot less warnings, <laughs> or a lot fewer warnings, because it doesn't have so many casting issues. So we're just doing the same thing again. We'll replace that. And then if this works, it could be a bunch of different things that have gone wrong, which is going to be frustrating. Oof. So if this doesn't work, that will be a sign that something has broken in box recently. If it does work, then that means I broke something or something was broken when I happened to check out box, which would be pretty scary. Almost. There we go. All right. So now we're running this, and everything should be the same. Completely stock box with the exact same configuration and inputs. And it's 32 bit box, which is the intended box bitness. We'll see if it blue screens. If it doesn't, then we'll run back over on the other other one because we did change the CPU model. Maybe there's just one magical CPU model that works and none of the others do. Ah. Okay, and they're blue screens. Fuck. What the hell? Um, let me try and find a known good config. So that is a sign that either something is broken currently in box, and we've just spent four hours debugging an issue that's not ours, or the config is so unbelievably sensitive. So I know I have a few configs sitting around that are, that can boot Windows, and I've never had issues with them, so let me uh, see if I can find where those are. I think they're on my other machine, one second. Uh. 
Oh, what did I call this project? Generic to do. I know somewhere. Fuck, where would that be? Uh, let's see. Do do do. Where the hell would I be able to find a working box config? Because I boot Windows all the fucking time. Uh, so this one, do, do, do. let's take a look at how they differ. So I can up the memory size and then I can also use the stock box BIOS, which is here. Address options equals fast boot. I wonder if that's it. I have no idea what that fast boot option, that must be new. I don't like that. And box just crashed. Uh, let's see if I do none. Okay. Uh, I, <laughs> I have no idea why. Jesus, really picky about that. What is, is there a box RC included with this install? Box RC sample. Where is, memory, ROM image. Let's be a share. Uh, what is going on here? Is it these? Does that have to be double slashes? Oops, where is my... Uh, Is that too much RAM? Oh, that's probably what's happening. So then we can go back to these. That's probably what it was. It's probably RAM. So let's see what happens this time. That. Huh. Otherwise, I have a different uh, CPU model I can use here that maybe will work. I'm not sure. Hmm. Okay. We'll see if we blue screen again. Yep. Uh, okay. 
So I guess I'm going to use Uh, I guess I'm going to use a config I have sitting around. AT enabled. We can change the CPO to this. Oops. And then sync non local RT sync zero. Oh, we'll see if this works. Uh, AVX that is a new feature. Where was that? This. And what else? AVX FMA, it doesn't like. BMI. Jeez. Zop. Probably doesn't want FMA either. Oh my god. Please. When does it end? SVM? I guess that's not on box by default. There we go. Holy shit. So maybe this is just a magical config that can boot box or boot windows in box. That that'd be kind of strange. It would be nice to know if I'm the source of these bugs. Maybe this whole time it hasn't been my fault at all. That'd be kind of weird. Let's see, this is, this one's an AMD processor instead. Uh, let's see, an X8 pick, SSE2, no SSE4. Misaligned SSEA SEP. I don't know what SEP is. Uh, maybe AS XSAVE SHA. Like, I would expect this to blue screen with the CRC thing, unless it behaves differently with AMD. It's possible that CRC thing is a Windows specific one. This might be the, this might be the magic one. Because it looks like this is probably going to boot, would be my guess here. Ips is 50 million. That is apple pie. That's that, 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 that. I'm trying to just clean up some space here. No. Close. I think we've probably found what's going on. It must be some really, really weird shit that's not being checked in CPU ID but still being used. So being AMD might somehow completely change how things are done. And I think I should be able to emulate uh, an AMD processor with the hypervisor with no issue, because this is gonna be this is gonna be a really weak processor. But I'm pretty sure this is about to boot. I'd be very surprised if it doesn't. It's just taking a while because this is how long it normally takes. But, oh, that's fucking annoying. Oh. <sighs> Yeah. Well, that'd be pretty cool if that's the issue, and it's not on me. It'd be nice to know why Windows doesn't want to boot in that environment, but ignore bad MSRs. Yeah, we're about to hit the setup screen here. Jesus. I guess it theoretically could have been the bi- well, no, it wasn't working with that BIOS, so it's not that. 
So I don't think it's frozen or anything. It's just it's just this slow. And then we'll use the exact same config and switch over to our version and see how that goes. It should work just fine. So we'll want just to disable things like VTX. So MMX we need, XAPIC, SSC2, um, misaligned SSC0, SEP, I don't know what that is. It's good that all of these are zero. That's good, PCID. It could be PCID maybe, uh, M8 and VMX. So we'll turn off VMX because we don't want to run VMX instructions. Yeah, so there's the setup screen. So that looks good. I'm just gonna assume that that's fine. So now we can do run.bat. This will run ours. And this should work equally as the same. There's no reason this would work any different because I, I don't think I've changed anything in, in box. So. Weird that my version runs faster. I wonder if I did anything to, to tweak it. So that's gonna be that. Uh, the Celeron, I guess we won't use anymore. There's some exceptions. That's fine. Just a mem set. And I guess we'll see where we're at. But it looks like this is gonna boot. I think it normally blue screens by this point. So. Yeah, it's just that config. It must be doing something really weird on Intel. It could also, I mean, with all of the changes that have happened with um, Spectre and Meltdown, there are a lot of like crazy CPU features being used. I wouldn't be surprised if some like really obscure CPU features being used. So, I mean, we're definitely a lot further than we've gotten before. I'm just gonna assume that that problem is fixed. So, I'm gonna take this file, I'm gonna save it here. I'm gonna look through my git diffs, and I'm gonna see if anything, if we did anything of importance. Because I don't think we did. I think we're just gonna completely reset. We have that covered stuff. Uh, Penrin changes, Prescott changes, instrumentation changes. Uh, that, I think, is the only relevant change. We added the CPID hook. And that's it. So I also want this code. We'll make sure we don't lose that. WHVP, we've just enabled exception exits and MSR exits, and everything else just goes away. So we'll just do a git reset hard. We will grab the config that works. So this is the working config. Uh, I gotta change that git ignore. So this will be, I think it's boot. We had a, boot was one of them, what else? And testing.py and star dot, dot on this. I think that will work. Yeah. So, and then boot.wim also. Test coverage that out as well. Uh, we can just delete that. And now the only changes are, we're now using that and that, 
And now we can go and add back in the CPU hooks. So that would have been in uh, Win32. Oops. WHVP will now exit on CPU IDs. We'll grab this. Uh, so the lib. Look at that, we just undid everything we've done in the past four hours. Because it probably wasn't our fault. So now we have CPU, CPU ID handling. Um, in this case, this is, we'll comment this out because we're currently not using the hypervisor stuff. And then in the box RC, we'll turn VMX to zero. And I think we should be able to emulate everything in here. I don't know what SEP is. Um, let's take a quick look. Uh, SEP. Uh, select sysenter sysexit instruction support. Okay, so that's sysenter sysexit, which we will want, and I think we'll be able to emulate that just fine. Uh, what else? What else was configured there? One gig pages, M weight is fine. And then I'm going to change uh, the lib again. And we're gonna make this always emulate. So now we're kind of back to where we were. I might deep clean. I just wanna make sure everything gets rebuilt and reconfigured. Just in case anything is in limbo after that. It shouldn't be, but I'm just always paranoid about that. So those are fine because we're just bypassing this. Emulating is always going to get called. And then uh, we're going to hit an infinite loop in CPU ID. Now we're going to let this execute in this context, so we'll get rid of that. So change this. Okay. All right. So we're just rebuilding box and everything. Okay, I'm just gonna make a change here to make sure that this file gets rebuilt just in case it's partially built. And now we'll be using box for CPU ID emulation. In all cases, I'm going to change my history and, oh, okay, so now, now it's the issue. Uh, Ips must be that, that's fine. Uh, yep. We're just going to change this requirement and get rid of it. And I think that should be everything. So now we're running in emulation mode only, but we're still using my hooks and kind of my environment. And if this boots, then it looks like the issue was just the CPU set. So, and I did disable VMX. So VMX is off, Xsave is off, Xsave opt is off. Um, now we're AMD, MMX, XAPIC, SSE2, SEP. I think this should be good. So we're trying to resolve that. Hopefully we're not killing perf too much. Looks like we're running is that 20 million instructions a second? That should be fine. So these callbacks are, uh, maybe we should just turn off the callbacks for this quick test for now. We'll just disable coverage. Uh, Cause the coverage won't affect anything. Like that's, if Windows boots, it'll boot with and without coverage. It's just a difference of time. 
Okay. This should work now. Oh, that's frustrating. I uh, Now, whether it will work with the hypervisor is hard to say, but now we'll always use CPU ID from box. Hmm. Sorry that this stream got super boring. And we're just gonna wait for this to boot. <laughs> I guess uh, we can turn that iCache, iCache entry. I th we can enable this caching again, which will speed that up a lot. Okay. So now let me see how this iCache works. iCache ink stats. So CPU utility flush stats. I know there's a way to uh, iCache lookups. iCache misses. There we go. Serve iCache miss. Just gonna keep an eye on this as it boots. So I'm just curious if it's safe for me to have this iCache present when I'm also running the hypervisor. So I think there's a flush iCache entries and this happens on a CS change. Uh, if that changes, okay. Um, Alec Trace, break links, flash iCache. So that's right at the start. This is on an invalidate. Hmm, it's possible that we won't be able to use the, the iCache when we're running the hypervisor because we might just have too many things changing outside of the view of box. Uh, flush iCaches, which one's, which one's bigger? This one calls flush iCache entries for each processor, stop trace, reset write stamps and this is what is called in init and also in uh in vd i don't think i did that it might be fine then flush i caches okay that's where it's defined it's called in the init which makes sense it's also called on NVD, but not on write back invalidate caches. And this one is, this is on CS changes. That's on alloc trace. When I, that's for creating a new I cache entry maybe. I don't know, but it looks like this is probably gonna boot. So we'll switch over to the enabling the hypervisor. What are we doing? We are adding, currently we're, we are running some tests for about four hours trying to figure out why Windows is blue screening. I thought it was my fault. Now I'm starting to realize that it was probably the configuration, which is kind of my fault, but Windows was not checking like CPU ID bits and it was blue screening and using features it shouldn't. So I have a config that's kind of a known good config. And I'm gonna go back and kind of enable everything again. 
So uh, let me, I'm just gonna make a work item for uh, investigate if keeping iCache enabled is okay. So I'm gonna make an issue so I can come back and see if I can enable this iCache but I'm going to keep it disabled for the time being. So I think we're almost there. Sadly, this kind of is really boring, but if this actually fixes the issue, then, uh, then we're gonna be able to run anything we want and then just start working on perf. So, yep. So I'm gonna, in the code, I'm going to change the iCache thing to, once again, always miss that iCache. Kind of a temporary, temporary thing. I think it's safe to say this is gonna boot. I don't know, I should wait though. It's been five minutes. I shouldn't cut it off early. So let's see, once that iCache is done. So I think we should just be able to go in and uh, emulating, be able to remove that. So now we'll use the hypervisor and then what we're gonna do is always emulate every time we VM exit. But first I wanna make sure that this, everything boots here just fine before I start to chase down a bug that's not mine. Oh my God, box is not known for being fast. <laughs> there we go, almost there. And then here, check if that, that's good. Emulating, oops, that's not gonna build yet. I'm just gonna wait for it to completely get to the splash screen because I really cannot afford to keep booting box in emulation mode. So once this works, then we're gonna turn on that hypervisor. We're gonna build it and then we're just gonna boot it probably again and again and again with different timing, timing characteristics to see if it blue screens. And if it doesn't, then we've probably correctly set up the environment that all the state and the CPU mode is is what we were, uh, what we're gonna use. So there we go. It looks like, uh, looks like everything's good here. So we're gonna, just gonna build this, which will enable the hypervisor. Um, nice, okay. So now we get to boot it at, at a lot faster speed. And we'll see if it blue screens or not. If it blue screens, then we're reporting that it has a feature that it can't run inside the hypervisor. Yeah, there it goes. Fuck. Ugh. I don't know what we're possibly reporting as a feature. Or we have a syncing issue. We're running a generic processor, MMX support, sysenter, sysexit. Um, maybe we can get rid of that. Long mode, monitor M weight, we'll get rid of that. No SVM, no VTX. So this is a smaller set of features. Uh, oh yeah, 
Okay, so you need that. That makes sense. Center versus exit. Monitor M weight, maybe? I could see that being an issue. But it's hard to say if that is. Um. Hmm. Uh, what's this? Don't put it. Okay. Oh, this is tough. So we have that blue screen in that. Let's, I'm gonna see if it crashes in the same way each time or if it varies. <sighs> Missing errors. We disabled that cache. Uh, fuck. I have no idea what it's possibly doing. Uh, Jesus Christ. Where are we? Let's add exception exit to see what's happening. So it boots with the config we have. So it's clearly an issue with switching between the hypervisor and, and box. So there are a few things that we could maybe stop syncing, like the X crow. Mm. What do we change here? Oops. This is probably gonna fail because we don't have the exception handler for our switch case. This will fail with like a unknown beam exit reason, I think. Really? Oh, I guess that won't do anything without the right mask set, uh, which I don't have. What is it possibly desyncing on? Got no CPIDs, and then shortly after we fault out. Hmm. I might need to enable the exception exits to figure out what's going on there. Or I can maybe turn on coverage, maybe. Let's give that a go. Oh, this whole day is like gone. Uh, what could this possibly be? Like it's not even booted up. Fuck. We'll add, I guess we can give it SSE 4.2 support. I don't know why that would be working in the emulator version of Box, yeah. Yeah, so that's not it. What else? X2 Apex, fine. MMX is fine. We're syncing all of those things correctly, I think. Oh my god. Okay. I guess we turn on exception exit. We add those prints to here. Let's 
CR2. Uh, the CPU this printer is CR2. I really gotta figure out this issue. Fuck. I don't know if it's box throwing an exception. Uh, there it is, throwing an eight. Throwing a double fault. We're getting a... Huh. Box is throwing a... Maybe we should get rid of Box's abilities to throw exceptions and make it so exceptions are always emulated inside of the guest. Inside the hypervisor, maybe. Because um, that, the way that reads is that Box threw an exception and fucked up the state. That is a set virtual processor issue. What am I trying to set? Got the XMEMS, FP control. This is saying it's not happy with the state that it's trying to write. Oh, these look fucked. Um, our flags looks fine. These look way off. Let's see. CFF3. Like, these are completely fucked. FS, that looks okay-ish. These look off. Is that? This LDTR limit seems off. What is going on? Exception faulting there. I feel like the state is not syncing correctly. Um, <clears throat> CPU IDs are okay. That we had a a six undefined instruction. How is that going to happen? I'm trying to find all the different ways that this is failing right now. Oh, I've been dreading figuring out what this bug is for this exact reason. There's just, you, there's no fucking insight into anything. It's completely blind. And you just kind of have to guess over and over. But, shit. How did that one fail? Failed at that address? On a six? How are things not syncing up? CS, SS, DS, SSGS. 
attributes look good. Let's see, what have I changed? Disable that, added print, commented out that. That's fine. That's fine. <sighs> so what is this possibly causing an exit for? Hmm. Like, is something getting fucked during sync? There's that one again. Unhandled VM exit. I'm gonna keep an eye on these attributes. That's, uh. These look like corruption to me. Let's, uh. I'm gonna make sure that I have. I'm gonna turn on page heap for box. Oops. Okay, so. If we have like actual memory corruption, then we should be able to catch that here. But I'm guessing it's like something's getting desynced in these, in the differences between these registers. So that's, let's see if it reproduces the same way now. Yeah. So it's definitely syncing issues. And let me just, I guess we're gonna print out every uh, every time we exit. Uh, print context. Let's make sure we can emulate there every time. I think we can. Uh, request an interrupt window. Emulate, emulate. <laughs> All right, so we're not gonna be able to boot like that, so we have to log. And then we're just gonna kinda keep an eye on when things seem to go awry in this context. And hopefully it's really obvious. Hopefully we're getting close. Because I can't do this much longer. This is brutal. So we see that these attributes are completely destroyed. If you look down, they're destroyed there. I mean, unless these are valid, is 093 fine? A limit of 77? CO 93 attributes. Unless those are fine. So, this is the last exit where it failed because it didn't like the one of the register states. And SF mask. So SF mask changed quite a bit there. So since the last exit, what has changed? We had, actually, let's see. I wanna get a different crash. I'm gonna get one of the ones where it actually uh, has a, uh, an actual exception occur inside and cause it a triple fault. I don't want the panic. There we go. So that's good. That's what I like. And so now we can see exception. What? Don't I print? 
when there are exceptions in box. Why am I not getting that print? Unless that one was like a completely different crash. But I want to see like what what the context difference is when that crash occurs. Okay. So I got a blue screen. Box will fail as it always does. Why is it not printing that we're hitting that exception? Unless we're not. <laughs> oh, I'm tilted. Jesus. I just want it to be like obvious what's going on. Those are those exceptions. Okay. I'll add them here. Maybe standard out wasn't being flushed. I could see that happening. Uh, how does, how do you flush standard out in Rust? Or actually, I could do, uh, first of all, we want that zero. So after that exception, we flush standard out. What else can we do? I think I can do this. Where are we at? We're in print. So that'll allow us to flush standard out just in case it's a flushing issue. Because I don't know how I wouldn't be getting those exception prints unless I had some pretty stupid issue. As long as I don't get a panic. Okay, so that should be flushed. Log.text. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that was just getting flushed out. Can I play some music? Um, so I don't play music intentionally because otherwise when I upload it to YouTube, then you can't watch it from pretty much anywhere except the US. So if you want music, um, just throw some on in the background. Because with no music, you kind of can control it yourself. So it is intentional that I don't have any music, which sucks because I'd love to be listening to music and sharing the weird shit that I, that I enjoy. Okay, so this is, so we've got box running. Why is it printing that again? I don't know why I'm getting that banner again. Like this seems all out of whack. Like what? What is? I don't know how that the box start banner is. Oh, it can't open test that asm. Uh, yeah, that's fine. 
because we're not running that. Copyright free music, yeah. I've, I've literally have no fucking idea why the like print out like I can't even get it to print correctly anymore. <laughs> like, how is the box logo so far down in the print? I've like what the fuck? Um, oops. Okay, we have exception. But how is how is the box banner in the middle of this file? Like we make the hypervisor map everything in, and then the banner prints. Uh, like is that actually how it happens? I don't think so. Uh, how how is this file like in different order than what actually happens? Does the carrot not work in in the command prompt? Holy shit! Like here we go to enter the VM. RIP is is the start of execution. It's chugging along. It enter. It exits once it's like almost done with bio stuff. And then here. So this is the reset. So I, okay. So I guess boxes. I guess boxes resetting there, which makes sense. Wait. So we have this exit. Um, I'm trying to figure out if like the CPU, if box is like resetting entire, like jumping to the start of the program, which is then causing the except like what on earth is going on? Cause like it'd be interesting if if box is resetting, then that's a that's a big issue. But I feel like it's not. Ninety-three. Uh. running all this shit. This is afterwards. Let me see. Uh, Box has their own logging thing as well. Read PCI register. Gate descriptor is not valid system segment. Gate destroy, okay. Maybe we, uh, this is, gate descriptor. So do we observe this? Yes. Oh, okay, so this is good. I like this. Gate descriptor is not a valid system segment. And then that's causing a fault. And this happens. We'll just kind of look into why this happens. Gate descriptor. So if there's an interrupt in long mode and Segment, am I setting up long mode interrupt? 
IDTR limit. If the gate descriptor is not valid, and it's saying that it's not, and the interrupt gate is gate descriptor, uh, D word one and two. This is from the IDTR. Interrupt vector must be an IDTR. So it's going to then read a gate Let me see if that happens in normal uh, execution. Where is my log is here and I can do So now we're always emulating and we're going to see if we have that same print. Uh, and I think we can just print. We can just run it now. I'll be right back. All right, so let's see where we're at. We've got, so this is saying that the gate descriptor is not a valid system segment. So it's trying to read things out of the interrupt descriptor table. That is happening here. And it's either not valid or there's a segment marked in it. So this is on vector, this is on an interrupt. So there's a chance that maybe we're syncing the um, IDT incorrectly and the IDT is getting kind of screwed up. So IDTR. So that's after a reset, that makes sense. So I'll kind of go back up in history. Like the IDTR hasn't changed. The contents of it could have changed. Uh, delete lines. Uh, not containing IDTR D. So it's that, and then it's that. Um, kind of chugging along. It sets that up, and then it goes back during the reset mode, which is fine. So let's see. In the box RC, I think we can change reset on triple fault zero and this is going to spam yep In the PCI registers, in CD, at faults there, kill simulation. Okay. So running this, 
I have no idea why that print happens there. I don't I don't think that's actually how it's happening. Box throws an exception here. And where is it at? It's running 95B. Is it where it's finally given up? A uh, move CL. Gate descriptor is not a valid system segment. So the IDTR is fine. Yup. So what's tough here is that it's going to be reading memory inside of the guest. So this is a long load interrupt. Must be in the limits. It's then going to read these quad words, which make up the descriptor. So I guess we're just going to fucking print these out. LMI vector u dot 16 dot x. And this is going to be vector desk temp one desk temp two. And let's also print out uh, IDT base. I do feel like I'm finally making progress. And then this will, hopefully this isn't too spammy, or I guess we have it. I guess it's fine. Unmapped, and there we go, gate descriptor. Here we can load this. So we should see uh, box is throwing an exception there. The IDT base looks fine. 7FF. But the entry is zeroed out. Okay. So. That's. Hitting an exception 14. We're page faulting on reading that address. So this is kind of where it's tough. Is it. Is that page fault not supposed to be happening? So like, is the fact that we're getting a page fault at this location causing us to get an exception that cannot be handled because the exception handlers have not been set up yet? Or are the exception handlers not being synced correctly and thus uh, we're supposed to get this exception but we're supposed to handle it but we're unable to handle it because these are zeroed out? And it's really fucking hard to say. Like, given we set up an IDT, we have this exception here that's trying to read this. And that's a page fault. And that instruction uh, is at 4F4. F. -F So how do I figure out where I am? I don't even know if I'm in Entos kernel. I might still be in like a, a loader of some some sort. And this is not gonna be unique enough to search for, I don't think. It's only three bytes and it's a... Uh... Oh shit, is that, is that unique? Uh, that is at A89. Uh, nope, that's that's different. That's just a coincidence. Right? A89, yeah. Uh, so it's not that. Hmm. I don't even know what it's 
trying to do. Emulated CPU ID. So we got to 471, then we exited at 332. Let me see. It'll all be obvious soon. <laughs> uh, let's print out the reason. And this will be VMR. So it'll hopefully tell us why it exited. It could be an issue if we maybe have an exception during an exception. So we'll see why why we're exiting. Oof. Okay. So that's just read MSR unknown register. Hmm. I wonder if it's that SF mask. Hmm. Like what? It's trying to set registers and it doesn't like one of these. Um, I guess we should look at this as well. See how this differs. So we had a, the last exit we had was a CPU ID exit. Did we run instructions? It looks like we emulated some instructions inside of box itself. We entered back in and DEA. It looks like we ran a decent amount. And what has changed? SF mask has changed. Uh, everything's the same here. Okay, it looks like star, L star, C star, and SF mask have changed. The attributes have also changed. So, looks like 9B, CF3. I thought the attributes were only 8 bits. Maybe, no, they are 16, aren't they? Access rights. Let's see what the, we're probably, mm. C64. So these look fine. That looks fine. CFF3, like I have no idea how that ES attributes would be changing. 4F3, CFF3. That's the same, 678B. FB0. TSE updated, TSE aux isn't. Oh, EFER changed. Uh, what is that? Oops. Where is the EFER? That's X Crow. Where would this be at? Oh, it's an MSR technically. 
EFER. So this is telling me that what it enabled was we did 4001 and we went from D01 to 4001, which means the only bit that changed was bit 13, 14? Yeah, 12, 13, 14. And I just closed that window, which sucks. EFER bit, uh, bit 14 is uh, FX, FFXSR. What is this? Enable during EFER. I'm pretty sure this is the issue. What is FFX? Uh, include support for FFX SR, which leaves out XMM on FX save and EFR, okay. So that's an AMD specific feature, which makes sense because now we're emulating this like AMD processor. We could maybe uh, where's the where's the stock box command? We're gonna try and boot this in stock box with an Intel processor instead, and we're gonna want F boxer C. BX generic. So that will boot fine in box because we emulate that uh, FXR. So it looks like it's, I mean, I feel like I wouldn't be generic CPU ID. Okay. They automatically enable that. Is that just implied? So it looks like that is always enabled. NX is always enabled. Compare Exchange 18, LHF, SHF. Am I reporting that I have that? FFXSR. I think I'm gonna disable that, see what happens. <laughs> FFXSR. I don't expect this to work. Um, hmm. Is this, is that working? Is that it? I'm skeptical. I think it's just stuck now. I'm guessing it blue screened, but silently. Uh, that's really hard to say though. Um, cause it probably checks for that feature. 
probably doesn't work without it, maybe. Uh, what are we running? We're running a push. It's possible that we were just uh, spamming this log and this was preventing us from making any progress. This is printing on IO port access. Oh shit. Um, uh, um, shit. What do I want to do here? <sighs> I guess we get rid of these spam prints. We still will have spam from box itself, but I think that might be fine. I don't know, was it that easy? Was it that thing? Because I guess maybe that's how we get in two different crashes. If we try and enter the VM with that already set, then we crash. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of those prints. Uh, exception, LMI. I think I also have the print on exception. Printf, this one as well. Okay. I mean, th this would maybe make sense if it like, Trying to think. Uh, right, linear, XMM word aligned, gate descriptor. Okay, so we still have that. But I think if we get past that, we might still survive. So there's still some syncing issue. But if we get past this point, are we fine? Nope. Oh my god. Why did it work that one time? Like a lot of this I think is based on timing of what's executed in the hypervisor. Like if I change uh, this, then I'll probably work. It's just like there's some weird sync state in some weird mode. Yeah, so this is fine. Hmm. Why is that so slow? Ground port access. Is it stuck? Let me turn off the coverage stuff. Stop. Yep. So that works pretty much as expected. Hmm. <laughs> 
So we're able to boot up into this. That works just fine. So I don't know, like, what... So if we emulate a lot, then we start to have issues. Do we handle anything here? No. Continue. I guess we could just... Hmm. FS pays next TI RPL base limit. Yep. So it, some interrupt comes through. So I guess we'll add that print back. I don't know if it's an interrupt or an exception that's happening. So I guess we'll just have to kind of see if it looks different in emulation mode and in hypervisor mode. I it's I just don't know if that exception is supposed to be happening in the first place. Is the exception wrong or is the syncing of that IDT wrong? So this is saying we're getting a we're getting an exception accessing some some stuff and then we get an LMI. Uh, long load interrupt for that, which makes sense. So I guess I'll just grab this. And we'll see if this it crashes the same way again. And if it does, then we can maybe run it in emulation mode and see if we see the same exception. <sighs> okay. What did this one fault on? See, this one faulted on reading a completely different thing. Box throwing exception. Oops. If exception generates an error. Okay, where is this called? What I could do is just always exit out and make sure that I could subtract off the instruction. Uh, exception. So on an exception, I can do RIP minus equals i island, I think. Is that right? So we can subtract off that and uh, jump up to, where's the CPID? We kind of had one like that, proc control. So subtract off that and then long jump back to the start. So this will effectively mean we never handle exceptions inside of box. Oh shit, I don't have access to an instruction. Well. Oh my god, are you serious? Insert RF, external, interrupt. Fuck. All right, there's something we can try here. What we can do is we can always emulate in box. But what we can do is make sure that we're uh, doing our context updates. So I'm going to 
that happens at the end. So we're going to get the context from box, sync it to the hypervisor, get it from the hypervisor, set it back to box, and then emulate. So now we're always emulating, but we're also always doing the um, register syncing between box. This will tell us if it's the syncing itself. <coughs> Oof, sorry. I'm trying to think if this will get stuck. Because this looks stuck. be awesome if we saw the same issue but I don't think we will I just think something's oh my god I have no idea what it could be could be sinking states it could be caches that need to be flushed in box it could be bugs in the hypervisor platform that like make it literally impossible for me to do this correctly. Uh, I have no idea what this could be. That's so frustrating. One second. Oh. And now I have no idea if box is stuck or just being slow. I guess I could put its iCache stuff on. Unless the iCache is needed. What if that's it? Like, it's possible that this iCache is required. just so slow I don't know why I guess I'm doing the syncing every time now PCI we've seen that I think those are the last messages we see before it dies, if I'm not mistaken. But I don't have that in the log. Because, like, if this works, then it's either some unbelievably hard timing problem that I just am not capturing. Or it's not a syncing issue. And then the only thing that leaves left is, I think, memory state. And that would be like the memory is in, is for some reason being cached in some way in box. And the hypervisor memory writes are not going through to box. So box is reading the IDT entry and it's zeroed out when it was like filled in in the hypervisor, but somehow zeroed out in box because it, didn't get updated like that makes no sense hmm. Okay. 
so I don't think we get to this point. Is that saying unknown MSRs divide setup IOA picks configured and then we have normal timing interrupts coming through, but we weren't seeing those in ours. So I guess we can comment this out. Maybe it is that iCache thing. I highly doubt it. So if that works, then it is unlikely to be our syncing, unless what could happen is that something's being reported inside of the VM differently than then would be emulated in box. And it's allowing it to do something in the hypervisor context that it wouldn't be able to do. So that just worked. I, have, I mean, I don't think it's that instruction caching. Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe that's required. I feel like it's a timing issue, so there's a lot of chance that I just get lucky there. Like, how much of that is, that was it actually working versus me just getting lucky that I didn't context switch in the same situation? <sighs> Unless it's reliably working now. Um, I just, I'm very skeptical. Hmm. I feel like the timing window has just changed. Uh, emulating equals 100. We'll go back to what we had. We had that. Let's get rid of these prints. Oops. And we'll build it. I don't know, I'm, I'm really skeptical. I don't... Is that really it? So now we gotta play the game of like... <laughs> is this... Is this statistically significant or are we just getting lucky 10 times in a row? Like how many times do I have to boot this? So this, in theory, should fail a decent percentage of the time. If that is truly the thing that matters. Okay, that failed once. We're one for one. <laughs> now we're gonna do this for probably a few minutes. Two for two. <laughs> no fucking way is it this. Oh my god. I expect that sometimes this will work. And it looks like that just worked. So two for three. We'll see if it makes it all the way. I don't know, how much is it just changing the timing window? I feel like there's no way that's the issue. Like, clearing the instruction cache shouldn't affect having a fault or not, unless Windows is like relying on an iCache entry being filled in, which would just be ridiculous. So that one worked as well. I don't know, I think it works more often than I thought. So, I think I just got lucky and all those times that I tried it with the iCache enabled, it probably just worked and it was just purely a coincidence. But now we gotta try it. 
Oops. So now we have the iCache enabled again. And see what happens. So in theory, this should never fail if that's the if that fixes it. Uh, let me change the timing. Since now we're changing the caching, the timing of things are off. So if it's like a weird window, then we might not be hitting it anymore. So we got to kind of jump along and try different windowings. But I'm guessing we're just getting lucky. I don't think this is actually working. Oh, really? Okay, we'll do a thousand. I'm just going to try different timing intervals to see if if any of them misbehave. And I expect that one of these will, and then we'll be right back to square one. Yeah, there you go. So, yep. Definitely did not fix the issue. We just changed the timing window. No surprise. This will probably fail again in the same way. Oh, that one worked. <sighs> hmm. Let's see what happens when we boot normal windows. Let that right out to disk. It's trying to boot into the like the safe mode or whatever. So probably didn't shut down cleanly last time. I just don't know what state it's possibly in that it that it contacts which kills it. It's taking a long time to boot because I have it emulating very frequently, so nothing, nothing bad here. I 
kind of like what it possibly could be doing. The X save stuff, I think, is. Like, maybe it's the X save state not being synced? Um. I can put some breakpoints on some of the instructions that maybe could cause issues. Maybe I don't allow privilege changes. I, I don't know. Like I could have box run more stuff in the hypervisor, but like maybe if I only have box ever emulate just basic instructions, but never emulate instructions that do mode changes, then maybe that would work. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's taking a long time to boot. Not, not too surprised. It's just emulating way too much. Emulate CPU ID. Hmm. It's weird that it like it only runs into the issue during boot, it seems. Which would be indicative of some like mode changes that are not in sync. Uh let's see. I can get rid of this. I'll emulate less. See what these boot times look like should be a bit faster. Why are those exits so slow? Airport. I don't know why it seems so slow. I wonder what I, I wonder if I have any like weird debug things on right now. Emulating plus equals 100. The CPU IDs, MSRs. Hmm, update that. Well, there we go. So that was a page fault inside of the hypervisor. Valid VP register value. Oh, emulating 100, go back. I don't know, I have no idea what this possibly is. It'd be really nice if this hypervisor was more transparent about what they report and what they don't report. Cause they don't tell you if you're getting all the CPU IDs 
I might have to look into the code to figure out what they do. But I... I just don't know what possible context is not being synced. And like clearly it's some timing thing that is related to let me turn that off as well. Let's find uh where is this? Doors disable. Can go down to Cover disable. Oops. Hmm. Now I can't get it to break. This is really frustrating. Guess we can emulate more maybe? I don't know. It's like changing these little timing things makes the bug no longer repro, so then you don't know if you fixed it or if if the bug is just like you're not context switching at the same time. Like this is like not even I almost didn't even want to boot. I don't know whose fault it is. I don't know if it's Box's fault for setting some state and then we transition into the hypervisor and crash or if the hypervisor sets some state and then we transition and crash. It's really hard to say. Not implemented by device. Like, now we can't get it to not crash. Maybe I can turn off caching again? I don't know. Please, don't work. It's like pretty much working every time now. Let me, uh... I guess we can turn off that caching. Even though that all that does is just change the timing windows. But Oh my god, why does it keep working? Like, how do you debug a problem where you can't <laughs> cause it to keep happening? And I don't think I can make my hypervisor stuff more deterministic, so that would be very difficult. I could maybe make, uh, there we go, okay. So, that one was gate descriptors, bad. Let's put those prints back in. So now we'll have, we'll be seeing these exceptions again. But it seems like this exception just shouldn't be happening at all. Okay, so now we're running, now we're getting an invalid opcode at five. Like EIP is at, at five. Or I guess technically it's at zero. So somehow we jump to the null page. And like I think, 
RIP. I don't know what would be stateful that would cause RIP to be a zero. I guess we gotta add all the prints back in. And we need to start running this to log.txt. Elevator pitch, what am I working on? Right now I'm working on fixing a bug in my hypervisor, but this is effectively a tool that combines the emulation of box uh, with the like performance of a hypervisor to use it to look and find, um, try to find bugs in various targets. Since it's a hypervisor and uses box, we're able to look at system targets so we can fuzz and try and find bugs in kernels, which is typically a, a pretty hard problem. Um, but currently I have a pretty catastrophic bug. So I switch between emulating the instructions inside of box and between the hypervisor very frequently. And there's something wrong with if I switch between those two modes, um, some state is not being synced in the right way that I'm getting these like incredibly non-deterministic issues that are pretty much impossible to debug. So it's going to take me forever to figure out how to fix this stupid problem. This is on GitHub. It is, you can find it here. Uh, okay, so gate not valid, it's good, okay. So we're getting gate not valid. Here, here we've jumped to zero, okay. So this is good, this I like, I like this. Uh, All right, so what we see is we have exited out of the, yeah, we've exited out of the VM due to a cancellation, so a timeout. We've exited with RIP pointing to this linear address, so that's what we're currently executing. Uh, that causes us to run some code inside a box, which then eventually throws an exception six uh, at null. So somehow code is jumping from, so we exit the VM with, with a reasonable state, I would say. And then we enter emulation into box and all of a sudden we find ourselves executing at zero. So Let's see what has changed. I don't think anything has changed between these. I could add a... So I'm very curious as to what the state is during that exception. Emulated CPU ID. And I, I'm still very concerned as to why this is in the middle. Like, I don't... I don't know how this ends up in the middle of the file. It makes no sense. But everything else looks sane. We fail on memory access because we can't execute the BIOS. The BIOS goes through, we execute things. Does all kinds of stuff. We eventually get into the kernel. We're running in the kernel and we get to this point where it looks like we had a couple timeouts in a row. Actually, this looks like C10, 6.9. Things are clearly using the XMM registers. SF mask has not changed. So let's change this log. That was a really good capture. So we're gonna, uh, before we enter, we're gonna do this. We're gonna get the context from box and we're gonna be like entering, hyper, uh, entering hypervisor. We're gonna print out the context and 
that should be it. And then what I'm going to do is on exceptions, I'm going to, that should long jump back, uh, which will go back to the deco loop, which will cause that to be reset. I think this should tell us the state that we try to re-enter the VM. We'll get the exception, and then it, we should try to re-enter the VM after the exception. So, it's kind of hard to say how this is going to behave. I just really want to fix this bug. <laughs> I've been dreading fixing this bug for so long, and I've only been working on this project for like a week but I still am dreading it. And once this is fixed, we actually get to fuzz and do things that are productive. But I'll need tests and I like, I won't be confident that the fix is fixed. Ah, right, cool. I'm familiar with malware bytes. I work as a security researcher already right now. So I'm pretty much already in the space. Probably, they probably do pretty, pretty similar things to what I do. So, throwing exception. Oh, my vector six. Canceled. This looks kind of the same. We enter the hypervisor. We're definitely executing a lot. Um, pretty massive state change. No CRs are changing there. Um, E11, 118A, 220. I'm trying to compare these to see if anything changed in this recent entry to the hypervisor. Um, doesn't look like XMMs were used at all. We cancel because we run out of time. And then we hop over. So, these look fine. That looks fine. Our flags has changed. Uh, what about the SF mask? C star, L star. So it looks like sysenter hasn't been configured yet. I wonder if, I wonder if it's a sysenter issue. That would explain how we could possibly jump to zero. But LMI vector six. We should be exiting out of the CPU loop in the exception though. We print that we have an exception, we go through, VM exit, if it's a fault, then if it's a double fault. Oh, this is interesting. There's state here of if two double faults happen. Things like that can be concerning. Uh, if it's just an exception, then we're going to get dr6 at gd. If it's not a double fault, and if the exception is not okay, then we're going to cause an exception. Uh, that's calling ourself. Uh, if it's real mode, then we get to this interrupt. That's where stack will be set up, and then we'll long jump back. So... Back to decode. So I'm going to try and see if I'm hitting this. Because uh, this jump buff, I think, is what I use here. Uh, yeah, so that's having me jump back, which should cause me to get re-execution, which should cause me to print that line. So I'm curious as to how I'm not <clears throat> exiting out. Ah, oh, boy. So that should be bailing out. We should be able to see that context during the failure of the exception. So here we had GP misaligned access. It's, it's just as if register state is being completely clobbered. Uh, 
So here, box throwing exception, LMI vector 13, box throwing exception 13, at a different location. This is kind of the same setup as before. It's whenever this cancellation happens here, I can't remember if it's the same address, but we're uh, FS base and GS base are the same. Move double quad word aligned. We're trying to load into RCX minus 32. RCX is basically null. It's almost as if something's just getting nulled out, out of nowhere. Like, the only thing I could think of is it's like some cache. Segment descriptor into CS cache. Like, some internal cache of box is not being cleared, and then box is using some internal state that is no longer relevant. So those are printing, creating hypervisor, learning exception 13. Like, how am I not hitting that long jump? How did we not get to here? Let's see what we had for prints. Prefetch, EIP is greater than the CS limit, which means we're still in protected mode right now. Debug break. Okay, so we just got a GP during a get iCache entry. And how are we going to handle this? It's a fault. We update those. If it's an ex uh, debug break, it's not. EXT. I wonder what that is. I wonder if there's some state in the, like, exception happening. So then we go into interrupt. That's going to cause the stack to be set up and everything. And then we should end up I don't, like how did that not get me execution back in Rust? Box ring exception. Uh, How did that long jump not put me back where I go? I, I, like, I don't even trust that this is outputting the log to a file. But I'm not gonna be able to boot like this. Like, I, I feel like the log file itself is just completely fucked. And if I can't trust the log, then how am I gonna even remotely, like, 
I don't even know. I don't even know. So this one's booting fine. Oh, no, it's about to crash. Uh, so this one we got an exception, move APS, due to, I don't know. Gotta see if I can run through this long jump and figure out where we come out. Uh, do, 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 get the stack limits. I think we're fine there. Oh, we're not. So, I mean, that, that long jump should come out in CPU.cc and set jump right here. So I can put a breakpoint on CPU.CC606. If it's able to resolve that, please. Okay. Wait, where's that at? Okay, so here we are. Oops. Good, we enter in here. What? We go into Rust. I guess this is a... Oh, I might not have, I might not be able to view where I am since this is in a closure. I don't know if I have symbol support for closures, probably not. So, I just don't understand this log file. Canceled. I'm curious if it's if it happens when I'm like in the middle of an exception inside the hypervisor and then I switch over to box and have another exception and the state's way off. Uh but why are these exceptions happening in box in the first place? Like Gate descriptor not valid. Like what? What's it doing? Like I don't even know what's executing because I can't even see like this log. <laughs> like clearly it's executing that and then it jumps out and we get to 1D675, which is kind of near it, but not quite. I don't know why this is printing out. I don't know why these are printing out. They're not happening there. Like these might even be interleaved with stuff above. I, I don't know, does Rust use a different standard out than, than uh, 
like that's the only thing that would make sense is if like this is all Rust standard out and then for some reason box standard out is like goes to a different location and then these are actually interleaved with these things because like these are long jumping out they they have to long jump out and then I get into here step device future report if emulating is greater than zero which it's not then we'll get a context and we'll print that I don't know, I'm like this, I, I feel like just capturing this log information isn't even working. I don't think you can do this on Windows. Nope, that just does nothing. They must have different print buffers. All right, fine. Fuck it. Then we'll make our own file, then. We will go into lib.rs. When we do this, we have to now open a file, because standard out doesn't work. Uh, let's see. File append. Okay, so we'll open a file here, and then we'll do write to file of that, and write this. Okay. Leaving hypervisor. God, this is going to be so slow. Uh, uh, no write format? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Dot on wrap. Oh man. Uh, what's happening? Not found. Uh, I think I also have to give it uh, create true. Let me double check that. Uh, creates a new file if it doesn't already exist. Yep. So now we have that. Do, do, do. All right. Now it's just impossibly slow. Oh my god. This is probably not going to be usable. Like, this is going to take five minutes. Uh, we'll see. I guess I need the box logs to go here too. We'll just see how long that takes. And in exception, 
is called foo.text. We will do file times fd equals fopen. Uh, foo.text. And we will do append. And this will be fprintf to fd. And then f close fd. So that's now going to that log file, right? Foo.txt, yeah. And then we don't really care about that. There's another printf in here. Okay. And now we need to remember to delete that file. Okay. So we should have a coherent log file now. Hopefully. It's just gonna be super slow. And hopefully we don't have to reboot it 50 times to get one to crash in the right way. Because we need to kind of get lucky here. Please crash. I wonder if this log file will be any different. I expect the exceptions should be interleaved with the actual, um, with the actual VM exits and entries, and that will give me a lot of information into kind of what's actually going on there. Problem is, I'm gonna probably have to do this a few times to get the right crash in the right state. And also, this is changing timing properties, so maybe it won't crash anymore. I'll be right back while this goes. So it looks like that uh, looks like that exception came through, which is nice. This is kind of everything we wanted. Hopefully, we didn't screw up our log. Uh, Foo.txt. So what the fuck? 
How is that not re-entering the hypervisor? Um, like, that's... That's... Context is default. I I don't even know. Uh I guess I I can't do prints anymore. I have to do these. I guess maybe the prints were fine cuz that was the right order. before I guess we want this and we'll just go back to what we had put this at the top Entering box CP loop. There's no context. Those are flushing. This, I guess we can go back to what we had before. Oops, not this. Uh, exception. Let's see if that long jump gets back to us. It should. Like, there's, there's no way it doesn't. I have no idea how it's possible that I don't run again. Yeah, we never we never get execution back at box. Okay. Where else could we go? Set jump. Is that Is this possible? I don't think so, but we'll put some stuff there in a second. Here we go, set jump, sync time. All right, how does set jump again work? Let me double check. I wonder if something else maybe hijacks the set jump during an exception and then I lose execution. I mean that shouldn't that shouldn't affect the bug, would it but it would affect what we're seeing. I think it returns uh on the first time it always returns zero. When the long jump is called with the information set to n, the macro enters again, this time it returns the value passed to long jump as the second argument uh, if this is different from zero, or one if it is zero. So I guess we're hitting this. Hmm. Return from set jump at flush standard out. 
And then here will be uh, turn from set jump all cases. I'm guessing we're probably maybe hitting one of these. Well, we don't have a GDB stub. BX debugger. Previous RIP. Um, and then down here, I guess we can say going back to Rust. So now we have a couple more prints that we'll see, hopefully. And if we don't see any of these prints, then I literally don't even know how computers work. It's like everything's going wrong. I can't even I can't even use a caret in my command prompt to get the correct log. I don't think I've ever had a bug fight this hard. It really doesn't want to be found. But that's okay. It's a challenge. I like challenges. Uh del foo.txt gvim log.txt. This is the one we're actively using. Okay, so now this is up at the top. See how everything like makes no fucking sense? Going back to Rust. So return from set jump for the first time. Then we're going back to Rust. Entering the box loop, creating the hypervisor, so on and so forth. Now if we go to the end of the file, we'll see that we get an exception and we we never long jump out. Okay, we're getting there. So we're seeing exception, but we're also seeing, we're seeing exception and then we're getting an LMI vector. So we know the last place we know we're running code is here. So if the parse descriptor, then we're hitting this which is causing another exception, which is then probably causing all of them icy. So this is probably where we're failing forever. So what I could do is make a quick, 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 quick hack. What we're gonna do is we're gonna find a long jump here. We're gonna go to our printf here. That'll force us to go back and we'll be able to observe the entire CPU state. I really hope that if this bug is obvious to someone, you, uh, you yell at me. <laughs> Cause I feel like I've just been doing nothing for six hours now. And that time it didn't crash. Well, maybe it won't crash anymore. I guess I'm just suppressing that exception. <laughs> there we go. That's what I like to see. Even log text. So now we should see exception. All right, so we exited the VM due to cancellation. We entered back in. We then cancel. Then we get an exception due to running kind of a code that's near this. We're getting an undefined instruction. We then try to get the gate and there's no gate present for this. So there's no way to handle this. We return from the set jump. We get back to this. We go back to Rust. We enter and we're trying to enter the hypervisor and the state that we're entering in is finally what we fucking care about. So this is the state when we last left the hypervisor. And this is the state when we went back in. And it looks like we executed some code. 6FFE. Um, I mainly care about control registers. 
we see that the DS attributes were modified. DS went from... Oh, that's interesting. So those attributes have changed. Uh, FS 93. Is this the first time we've seen? No, we've seen these attributes before, but what is that? What else has changed state-wise here? Uh, da, 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 da. I'm just trying to line them up. Oops, went too far. Okay, so these are now. What's interesting here What's really interesting here to me is that all the GPRs have the same state, but R flags has changed, RIP has changed. Uh, the limit for ES is, or the attributes for ES have changed, the attributes for DS has changed. Um, those look good. TFC, of course, changes. EFR. The pat's the same. SF mask is the same. The CRs uh, look the same. Uh, XMM controls are the same. The XMM contents are the same. Status and tags are the same. Uh, this is actually kind of interesting. This is a lot more catastrophic than I expected because what this is telling me is somehow we're executing potentially a significant amount of instructions to the point that we're able to change segments yet we don't see a single general purpose register or XMM register change. Not even a bit changes. And I just, that stands out to me as probably uh, something's wrong here. It's possible that, let's see, RIP. So our flags has changed. Fuck. <laughs> if only this cancellation was deterministic so I could like turn on single stepping once I hit this cancellation for the first time. But like what is possibly going on? What what is a noticeable change? The ES and DS attributes changing is significant. Let's see, have we ever seen the hypervisor exit? Oh, here we see CF. When we enter the hypervisor, we have CF. And when we leave, we have CO. And I would suspect that that is... Uh, oh, are my limits off? So I'm curious if the hypervisor and the and box have a different understanding of what these attributes are. But it looks like we're able to leave and enter the hypervisor with those attributes set. But is that the cause? Or is that completely unrelated and it doesn't matter? So let's see. Let's see if this code is executed in other places. Looks like here we enter, cancel out, we enter back. Uh, this is exiting at 7a. 07a, then we enter, and we leave at 1a6. We enter at 077. C 
CP loop. Um. All right, we'll add some prints. We'll add some more prints. Uh, where are my routines? They're up here. I'm gonna do print. Uh, this is syncing box context. So we're gonna get these prints telling us whether or not this state has been synced. Syncing uh, hyper. So we'll see if these functions are getting invoked. Maybe there's like some weird way that we're not syncing state after an exception or some strange event. And that would make a lot of sense. Well, it wouldn't make sense that it's happening. I don't know how that would happen because there are no control flow decisions during those context changes. Um, so, and that time it's not crashing. Okay, that looks good. Okay, go to the end, find where the exceptions are. So the first exception we got was a page fault when trying to access FFFFF, which is not in the state of execution of box. So we cancel boxes throwing an exception, syncing box context to hypervisor context. So this should be updated in theory. But once again, it looks like the state hasn't changed, but oh, this time even execution hasn't occurred. Oh, wait, I was comparing the same one. Ah, uh, but it looks like it's still the same. 3840. So execution happened. Um, I wonder if I'm skipping instructions. I think box updates the instruction pointer before execution of the instruction on an exception that might cause, hmm. Well, we shouldn't be getting this exception in the first case. So, we cancel out, we then, everything is the same. Like the fact that this context has not changed at all. Even though a lot of execution has occurred. Is really concerning. But I think we're getting close. I'm curious. Well, the set jump shouldn't be happening. Canceled. Syncing hypervisor context. Like, I mean, maybe this is. No, this is definitely printing it. And it's getting it. IDT base at this. So this is saying we're faulting at F1A. 
and then we're going back to F17 because this is the instruction after. And then we come back to this. Hmm. What is this doing? Like in every other context, does register state change? So we've got, let's uh, scroll up to this one, canceled, VSP. And then let's look at where it entered and that changed. Not significantly, but register state did change. Uh, EIP is the same. 75 FOB. Box context, IRS context. Hmm. Uh, syncing hypervisor context to box. Node changes. I'm just going to print the RIP value. I'm going to see if that changes. Like, it's, it's hard for me to say, Is are the prints the actual issue? Or, like, is it when I'm printing it? Is it something with the long jump causing the stack to be in a weird state and, like, the Rust FFI is really unhappy about it and things are just getting messed up? Um, I don't know if an unwind occurs. Because that thread local should be borrowed. When it goes to re-enter, that thread local should be borrowed. I don't know how that thread local is getting dropped. Um... Does anyone know how like uh, long jumps work with with something like Rust? Okay, so we'll probably see the same thing again. We'll get canceled, VSP, syncing to hypervisor context, and there it is. Step CPU, I could add a print on. Uh, we could go here, we can change this out. We can make a new one. An i64x rip. This might be way too slow. I don't think this is going to be fast. This might be too slow to actually even run. Oh, maybe not. It might be kind of usable. Well, that was early. This log file is going to be huge now. How big is it? Almost a gig. So, exception. Yeah, that just might not have run the same way. 
run it again. Hopefully this crashes in the normal way. Oof. There we go. This one's going to be huge. Yeah, a gig. Uh, we'll make it work. <sighs> GVIM's fast. Come on, you just gotta search a gig. It's just some regex. There you go. All right. Okay. So we see that we exited at FFE. Whoa. This is saying that I exited, I, I sync this state to box. I'm running 1D676FFE, and then I go to run in box, and I'm running 1D675E74. And then where do I exit? I exit at E7F. What the fuck? This is the state that's being synced. Let me see. <laughs> I wonder if we're skipping like a massive amount of code. Like every time we context switch, we skip like hundreds of instructions of like so here I get the context. I then set this context. Uh, coverage is currently disabled, so that doesn't run. We come through here and we print that context. So we're printing what we're setting in box. Uh, okay, so we add another print here. RIP equals... Here we go, okay. Print a box. RIP now, percent i64x, rip, and f flush, center out. And I'll print before as well. Before. <laughs> we might be pretty close. This could be a pretty stupid bug. And then I'll have to get reset again and put in whatever the fix is and then try it a million times and hopefully we don't have the same bug in a in a different way. Like, this might make sense if box doesn't decode at RIP, if it uses like a cached value of RIP, and then every time I context switch, I like sometimes don't, uh, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I guess we're gonna see pretty, pretty, pretty shortly here. We're gonna close this, reopen it. It could be some weird FFI stuff. It could be box doesn't decode from RIP like I thought. Okay, so this is saying box RIP before was FOB, which is probably where it left us off. Yep, FOB. 
And then now boxes RIP is at FFE. And then when we start executing in box, we run FOB. It's like way off. Is that is that a number that I should know? Uh, FFE minus this 10 E that that means nothing to me so I don't think that's just some weird coincidental value I'm guessing box does not execute at RIP then so we set that context we come around and then we'll do uh, Then we will, I need to add one more print, which is when I enter the step CPU, printf entering step CPU in box, print i64x, rip. So there's a chance, there's one thing I'm checking here, since devices step uh, during the, between these points, um, it's possible that maybe devices cause execution to occur. And maybe I have a device that's causing, um, like when I'm stepping through those devices, maybe one causes an interrupt to occur, which then causes like RIP to get updated. So I'm gonna see if that's the case. If not, then the fix might be a lot easier. So I'm hoping that the RIP is the same at the start of this step function. Because uh, that, that might be a debuggable problem. Because then it's probably a matter of like, oh, RIP can be a different location in box than just like RIP. There's cached RIP or something. And then I just have to know that now I have to update that. We will see. So entering step CPU in box. Uh, we didn't flush that, but I think we're fine because we'll print other things. Yeah. So entering step CPU at 1D676 FFE. And then it's saying it's running at this uh, 1D7. 1D67, okay. All right, that's looking good. So if we go into, so we've got get iCache entry is how it's determining where to execute. This is copied exactly as below. So I think we're running everything correctly in box. What's EIP page bias? Oh, well, that's probably fucking it. Are, is it ahead of us or behind us? It's behind us. I guess the bias maybe could be negative. We're just going to print that and run that while we read the code a bit more. Um, but that, that, that looks interesting. If that can be a negative number, then that needs to be reset to zero every time we re-enter. Uh, where do I want to print this? I want it in CPUC. I want the first occurrence of this. This is mine. Uh, printf EAP bias is i64x. Uh, yep, that's a BX address. Boundaries of their current code page based on EIP. And we'll just get this going right away. So get iCache entry is going to add EIP page bias to get EIP biased, which it then looks up for this cache entry, but the cache entry is always null because I force it to be. But then we go into here and we pass in EIP biased and P adder.
Uh, okay, there's a there's a lot of stuff going on here that I probably need to worry about. So EIP biased fetch page. So this is the physical address of the base. So I'm guessing RIP is probably set to a page aligned value. EIP page bias is the offset into the page. We make sure that we're inside this page window size. We then grab the page and offset into it. So I am highly suspecting that this is, these biases need to be recalculated every time I re-enter. Um, oh, this, this one happened to be working. So I'm guessing it's caching the physical address translation of execution. And I need to make sure that that is thrown away. So EIP page, page bias. It's calculated here in prefetch. Uh, if in long mode, if it's not canonical, then flip. Otherwise, get the page offset, then linear address is equal to rip. Page offset is that. Window size. Okay, I think I just literally just need to call prefetch before on those transitions. I think box is about to die. We'll see that this page bias is set to some gigantic negative number and everything will make sense. We'll see. So we should have uh, exception. Oops, that was actually the one I wanted. Yeah. So we've got an exception, and then EIP bias is this this negative number, which is just gonna it, everything's gonna be broken. Okay. So now we can do prefetch. And I guess we just need to call this on those context switches. Let's see what it looks like. Uh, yeah, if it's out of the window size, then we prefetch. So I'm guessing this bug probably only could happen if you context switched while in this window size and it didn't cause a new prefetch. And then I'm guessing that these biases are all kept up to date. Well. EIP page window size. Uh, unless this stuff is like all the math checks out and it's like if it's out of bounds of what we, where we thought, well, translations could have changed. It could be if we context switch when a, trans uh, a page table modification occurs. So let's go to get i uh, cache entry. So what we're going to do is anytime we re-enter the CPU, then we're going to call prefetch, and then we're going to assume that box can handle everything on its own from there. Let's see. Prefetch. I'm just trying to look at occurrences of where this is used. So they use it there. And they use it on link trace. If EIP has changed a lot. So I think we can just do it there and it will keep it up to date. Let me look for other calls. iCache, boundary fetch. Yeah, this is probably fine. Uh, and then this is going to be box CPU, this pointer, prefetch. So we flush the TLBs. It then prefetches. Um, let me do that on the other one as well. 
on step device. And we'll TV flush at the end as well. Uh, okay, so what do we have spewing right now? We've got lib.rs is spewing. Uh, print right here. Actually, anywhere where SDA standard out is printed, we can leave that first one because we should only long jump rarely. So we'll keep that in there just for quick debugging. We might have some other spam. We have the, we literally have the printouts on every instruction. That's probably a good one. Um, so we can just get rid of that. And am I a software engineer by trade? Uh, not well, kind of. Like I professionally write software now, but I am a uh, like security researcher more so. So software engineering is not my like specifically my title or whatever, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, sinking box. Okay. Um, but I have to do it a lot for what I do, anyways. So. If that answers your question. So the answer is yeah, I, I get paid to write code, but I don't have to necessarily write code to fulfill the my job goals. It's a really weird way of describing my work, but technically that's true. <laughs> like I could just go into work and find bugs and I mean, people would be mad that they it doesn't scale like, I can't just give that to other people, but I wouldn't get fired. <laughs> so, uh, what were we checking here? I think it's, I think we're just expecting it to work, aren't we? All right. Uh, then the ips are jumping around a lot there. Let's see. What are we doing? So now I just expect it to be slow because it's doing a lot of box emulation. But, so that didn't fail. Now we're just gonna do this a couple times, I guess. Holy shit, did we fix the issue? That's a timer interrupt. Okay, so that's worked twice. I'm pretty sure we fixed it. This makes uh, an unbelievable amount of sense. So it, it lines up with all of the issues I've been seeing. Yep, that worked again. So now we have to, you know, say, hey, maybe we change timing properties. So we change the amount that we emulate each time. This is kind of how I'm going to figure out whether or not this is, uh, with whether this bug is fixed. And if it's fixed, then, uh, then we're pretty much good to go to actually make the tool good. So. Holy shit. We might have fixed a bug. Uh, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Son of a bitch. Uh, throwing exception. God damn it. Um. <laughs> Maybe we'll throw a prefetch before every time we grab an instruction. Uh, t -t -t -t. <laughs> oh, fuck. I thought we figured it out. I was finally feeling that upswing of, wow, this code might work. 
<laughs> and I might be done with this seven hour bug chase, but I'm right in the trenches. Ah, uh, what? That's, to me, this looks like the fill pattern for page heap on Windows. And this makes me think that an uninitialized value is being written to RIP. Like it's completely invalid. So how would that happen? <laughs> I guess let me put that sync print. I think that was probably the most useful one I had of, let's go back to, what were we doing? We just added the prefetch before there. I'm gonna add that, 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 and uh, what do I want? And that might be off because prefetch might change what RIP looks like. So this is now gonna to be too spewy. I think we're probably back in the trenches. go so this one doesn't have the c0 thinking box RIP before RIP now stepping CPU Okay. With that stepping, it's throwing exception there, which I think lines up with before where it like ran five instructions or something. Uh, or no, that's completely different. I just saw the F at the end. Let's see. Does prefetch always recompute that? If we're in long mode, then we set up these biases. Uh, I think we're in long mode. Maybe not. We could actually be in protected mode. So. Yeah, page bias. Oh, I see that's like segment based stuff. That's cache, but I actually update that cache, so I sh should be fine. Change the window size. Frequent check. Hmm. I'm curious if this is actually affecting it. So prefetch and long 64 mode takes RIP. Which is what I update and what I print. Gets the page offset of EIP. Oh. I'm starting to get tired. Page bias, RIP page bias, and top 64. I think that's fine. How does it look up this? It's just the page offset? 
And then there's the else. And then in all cases, then it goes, I'm guessing, to look those up. So TLB entry of, I think I'm flushing these TLB entries. Physical address. And then the fetch pointer, oh. EIP fetch pointer. That's a pointer to the actual memory, okay. So it's either look it up or, okay. So that's coming from linear address is what's being read. Could be that. It could happen if CS base changes, potentially. Otherwise, it's just exactly rip. We didn't like not build it or something stupid, right? Uh, Prefetch. VIP, VIF. I don't think that's going to be the case. Clear those. Hmm. I guess I could see here printf instruction from i64x. Oops, fuck. I completely missed that format string. God damn it. Rip, or not rip, uh, linear address. Wow. <laughs> that would have been good. Maybe that's why I was seeing the C zeros, because I just printed out uninitialized shit. I can't believe format strings are not like fatal issues like that. I guess they're warnings, which you could turn on to be fatal, but. There we go. There's the exception. Was that, now it's that. Prefetching at that. Stepping CPU. And then prefetching instruction from there. Oh shit. So, I think if you prefetch twice, so the first prefetch, I think, changes the... I'm guessing if I prefetch twice, yeah, the, the first time it's there, and then the second time it drops to a different location. Oh, unless that actually had an instruction. Unless it's looking at the next page. Prefetching here, stepping CPU here. And we're prefetching from the next page as well. I don't know. Hmm. Stepping CPU there, prefetching instruction. And that's saying that it's actually grabbing Okay. 
stepping CPU, and maybe that doesn't update the prefetch because it's. No. Let's see what an, uh, like a, hmm. What would be something that would reset? Maybe the, like a CR3 EV. Move under CR3. Uh, okay. Yeah, RQ. So that calls invalid pref invalidate prefetch queue, which I thought I called that actually. Oh, maybe not. Okay. So I think when we go to re-enter, we should basically do everything we're seeing there. So we should invalidate the prefetch queue and and I'm guessing that just sets the yeah that sets the window size to zero, which then calls it toys prefetch. So that's probably the correct way to go. What changes that we made? I really hate undoing all this shit. Entering step CPU. Oh, I guess we want that. So we should do TLB flush and everything done here. Invalidate prepatch queue. Call some hooks. Is that all it does? Okay. What about... So I guess all that does is that. TLB control, set CR3. That'll probably flush more. Uh, it does a TLB flush for everything, which I think we already do. Yep, TLB flush is okay. So then I'll invalidate that queue. So we'll go into here and yeah, if you biased will always be greater than the window size, I guess. I don't know what else that will cause to happen. I feel like that's not the issue. Ooh. All right, so it still fails. So now I can print that prefetch address again. What else? If you biased. So this will tell us what it's actually using for the physical address, which should end in the same thing. And 
And then we don't use that at all. Survive cast Ash Moose on that. Okay. Is that now it's that entering step CPU I cache entry is that that actually makes sense even though it's a physical physical address it's just identity mapped then we fail on EB What would be there? That's pretty high up in memory. For how much do we give it? Ten twenty-four? Okay. Mm, LDT base. IDT base. I guess this it could just be a jump instruction. I just don't know how you consistently hit a jump. Like it'd be a weird. Um, fuck. I think we can read physical memory without causing a fault. And we want to read for 16 bytes. What else? Probably the buffer. Is that it? So now we're doing the same shit we did before, where I'm just going to put in, I'm gonna like read these as byte swapped quad words. I feel like I didn't do that right first try. <laughs> okay, shit. So I can't always read 16. I have to read whatever's remaining on the page. Really? I think I could just look up the physical address and just print that off. How do I do that in my... Guess this one. to type or execute, there we go. I don't know if that had to be aligned or not. I think this returns 
with the alignment figured out. Get vector address. Yeah, that is the offset. Okay. So this will finally tell us what the instructions are. I think Box has a built-in disassembler that you can use the API for as well. I could maybe try and use that and try and print off what these instructions are. That took really long. I think reading that memory isn't cheap. Let's make sure buff, buff plus eight, it's char. Yeah, that looks right. All right, so four two. And I think this is in protected mode. So that's saying that's an ink EDX, really? Four two O F? No, uh, maybe this is sixty four bit already. Uh, oh, that's x86. There you go. All right. That just looks like fucking trash. So why is it going there? And then it says the next instruction that it ran is this. There's the direction flag. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I'm probably going to have to call it a night. I will probably fix this issue and then actually work on writing a real fuzzer. So I think maybe, I don't know if I'll do any weekday streams. It's hard to say, but I think if I figure out what this bug is, we'll probably make a new stream. That is what this stream was supposed to be is of writing fuzzers and writing snapshot and restore routines and stuff. But I don't know. It's like doing something completely wacky that I don't understand it all yet. So anyways, thanks for watching. Catch y'all later.